640 acres of beautiful, pristine parkland. Just the sort of place you'd want to go and visit on a Sunday morning into afternoon in uh, Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Maybe have a picnic, do some outdoor activities, or just sit around and be entertained by some of the best sports cars in the world. Right about halfway between Milwaukee and Green Bay, Nestles Road, America. Since September 1955, motor racing has taken place on a circuit which just over the four-mile uh, notation is, well, pretty much exactly the same as when it was laid down all those years ago with action areas at Turn 1, if you're brave, and that very fast turn into the first corner. Down the hill to Turn 5, make sure you do that one cleanly or it can end up in disaster. Turn 8 is a downhill as well before you head into the signature carousel and then it's flat out if you're brave through the kink and down towards Canada corner the lowest part of the circuit from there it's all back uphill to the start finish line hello everybody and welcome along to our latest installment of the 2020 story that is the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship I'm John Hindhoff for IMSA Radio and IMSA TV and joining me in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre is Jeremy Shaw our VP Racing Fuels pit lane and paddock reporter is Shea Adam. The cars are rolling in what can only be described as pretty decent uh, weather conditions. Uh, on the track, 93 degrees Fahrenheit in the air, at 75 for those of you listening uh, on 87.7 FM around the track, around the world on RS2 and on IMSA TV, 24 Celsius in the air, 34 on the track a qualifying session Jeremy Shaw that was dominated by accurate team Penske at the front of the field in behind them the two uh, Mazdas and then a couple of Cadillacs uh, also right in there and that should give us plenty of excitement Shea Adam is Checking out all the stories for us. If you weren't with us for the Michelin countdown to green, we are down here, Adam, to 30 cars to take the green flag in a few moments' time. Yes, unfortunately, the heart of racing Aston Martin, and sorry to Sarah Rigby, the biggest Aston Martin fan in the world, that car will not be taking the start of this race. The team, which has sat out since the 24 hours of Daytona back in January, looking to make their return this weekend. Well, it was a fuel issue, a small leak in the fuel system worked tirelessly all through the night to try and fix it. They decided this morning that they couldn't actually get it to a place where it was completely fixed and rather than send out an injured race car to limp around the track, they pulled their entry. The team getting on Twitter that they hope to be back are around at the end of August, and we sincerely hope to see them back once again. So no Aston Martin for Ian James and Roman DeAngelis. Some changes to the IMSA calendar announced uh, yesterday. Go to IMSA.com for all of the details. The current COVID-19 crisis uh, necessitating some change of venue and some splitting up of some of the events as well. I won't bore you with that right now, but IMSA doing their level best to keep the same number of races in the calendar as we go through this difficult 2020 season. Jeremy Short, the front of the field. It's the two Acuras who have found some pace here on the long, flat-out blasts at Rhoda Murray it is indeed uh, the Acura team Pesca on the front row for the second year in a row. Last year it was Dane Cameron, this time it is Ricky Taylor and uh, they are feeling pretty confident coming into this race. They feel that their, their car is working well, uh, they've been helped by the balance performance changes that allow them a little bit more fuel compared to the Cadillacs in particular and also the Mazdas. So, but uh, the, judging by qualifying, there doesn't seem to be much to choose between the, the turbo cars from Acura and Mazda. I'm sure in race trim, the Cadillacs are always more competitive in any case. I think we've got an exciting race ahead of us. Uh, Porsche keys to the race. Uh, we will have to remind ourselves this is a four mile race track, so you can't get it wrong on fuel having eight tenths of a lap left in the tank here is not much good when the run from canada corner to the pit lane is all uphill tires well it is a low grip circuit so you can't abuse them early in the stint although teams reporting the tires have been giving good performance right the way through their lives we'll see round about four pit stops for the leading cars in dpi take your chances but be patient 
because there are places here at Road America where you have to follow. There's plenty of overtaking spots as well, so that's when you have to be decisive. And believe it or not, once again, we have got a little thought that there might be some weather just to mix it up before the end of the two hours and 40 minutes. Those are your Porsche keys to the race. Coming up after the race, we'll discuss all of the talking points in Michelin post-race tech, but for now, settle in. And whether you're at the track or further afield, you may have a full seat. You're only going to need the edge of it for the next two hours and 40 minutes as we go green at the IMSA Road Racing Showcase. And immediately the master number 55 of Harry Tinknell jumps into second place and splits the Acuras. But it looks as though right round the outside that... Dane Cameron was trying to get that position back the down at turn three. My goodness me, that's very tight indeed, but good racing room given by both of those drivers. That was close racing, but that was clean racing as well. And Cameron gets a run, flicks to the right-hand side. That means he's got to go all the way around the outside into turn five. They almost touch again. Orange and white paint and soul red crystal being traded there right across in front of the Mazda as the second place is regained. Dane Cameron, very forceful round the outside, then chopped back in front of Harry Tinknell to make sure he defended the uphill entrance to turn number six under the Corvette Bridge. But a statement of intent very, very early on from Harry Tinknell there, as for a moment or two, what, let's call it five corners, Jeremy Shaw, he split the two accurates. Uh, good to see really respectful driving there from those two. Not, you know, they could have, one or other could have pushed each other off the road. They gave each other room. They didn't want to incur any damage in this early stage of the race. So it was interesting, though, wasn't it, uh, the speed of that Acura on this run down to turn five. The car seemed pretty equal most of the way down that long straightaway. But then towards the end, the Acura appeared to have the edge. Was that the draft? Was that a bit of horsepower? We will find out. They, the Acuras have been given a little bit of a, a break on the balance performance this weekend in terms of their boost. They've been given a little bit more power, and clearly they took advantage of that on that first lap. Hello to Nigel Scott, Dobby, to Benny Carrillo, to the crotch belt, and everyone else who's listening, as well as all of you at the track on the PA at 87.7 FM 31. Philippe Nazar has Joao Barbosa right ahead of him. That's two Cadillacs. The red and white car goes to the right-hand side in towards the first corner. Those two different colours used to be run by the same team, but not anymore. So that is a proper battle. No quarter asked or given there. And through goes Nasser as he drops down to turn number three. That was made. And a nice use of good old-fashioned slipstream. No DRS pass flappage going on here. That was all about getting in the draft into the hole in the air that the car in front was making. So Taylor from Cameron by about a second, then half a second back to Tinknell, and Nunes is just three tenths further back. Ryan Briscoe's had a tidy start in the Connick and Minolta number 10 car, running in fifth position. He loves this place. Then it's uh, Philippe Nasser just having made that position on Jao Barbosa and Chris Miller. In LMP2, Patrick Kelly is on a rich vein of form at the moment. In the dark blue and white number 52, that's the PR1 Matheson Motorsports car. He's got two and a half seconds already on the Dragon Speed. Evil Knievel uh, livery on the Dragon Speed 81. Then it's the ERA Motorsport car, the Aero Motorsport car, and then Cameron Castles. In GT Le Mans, Jordan Taylor for Porsche leads from Corvette Racing... Uh, sorry, Jordan Taylor for Corvette leads from the Porsche of Lawrence Vanter. And then Bruno Spengler with the two BMWs. Line Stern now, 25 and 24. Ollie Gavin down in fifth for Corvette Racing ahead of Fred Markovecki. So the pole sitter has been uh, bumped down a position there. And in GTD, Aaron Tielitz for Ian Vassar Sullivan holds on to his pole sitting position with Robbie Foley in, set, in uh, third behind Frankie Monte Calvo. It's Gar Robinson in fifth position. He's got Compass Racing's McLaren in front of him in fourth. 14, 12, 96, 76 and 74. And then Cooper McNeil is 63. That's your top three with the Ferrari in sixth position. Sorry, your top six with the Ferrari in sixth position. What a start by Patrick Kelly as he goes across the line. Jeremy Shaw, he has been absolutely brilliant the last couple of races and has really shown his skills. He certainly has, hasn't he? Another great start there. He was uh, one point uh, 
or two points four seconds ahead of the second place car at the end of the first lap it's extended that lead by another second and a half on lap two so yes uh, patrick kelly he just loves his straight track wasn't it cool to see how euphoric he was when he got out of the car after getting the pole position yesterday yeah he was a happy man i think it's fair to say what a start to the 2020 season for Corvette Racing, sat on 99 IMSA wings for a little while, shall we say. Let's not, let's not remind them too much of that. But it didn't take them too long to get their 100th in 2020. And how cool was it that on our additional makeup race, if you will, at Daytona on the Saturday, the 4th of July, with the Rockets red glare in the air, the Corvette came through and America's sports car notched its century of victories in IMSA racing. It took nowhere near the same amount of time to get the 101 because they have now won two in a row, having had the uh, second of their cars. So both the three and the four now have notched a victory this season, and that was at Sebring last time out. In GTD, Aaron Tealitz and Frankie Montecalvo, well, they've had a pretty good start to the season as well with the Lexus. A lot of hard work gone into these cars over the last season and a bit. And those cars have been very impressive indeed. Their lead from Robbie Foley, who had a nasty accident in the Turner Motorsport BMW M6 GT3, where there was a braking problem caused by a loss of uh, braking fluids. Some debris, we think, uh, got into a brake line and caused the brake pressure to go away at Turn 5. The car looked uh, pretty second-hand, to be honest. On the right-hand side, pretty much every panel between the wheels was dented and bumped. And three hours later, it came out for qualifying, looking like it just rolled off the truck, because that's how Will Turner and the rest of the team roll. They weren't just going to fix it. They were going to make it look exactly as pristine as normal. At the front of the field, it's Ricky Taylor and Dan Cameron split by 1.3 seconds. And with two hours and 33 minutes to go, it's been a clean opening to the race. Thank goodness. Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, I agree. It's a bit nice. It's, that, that is a relief to see, isn't it? Uh, some good racing on the first lap. But now the rugby gets to, to string out a little bit. The two Acuras separated by about a second. 10-12 car lengths and a similar margin back already to the Mazdas. And uh, the Cadillacs, a little bit unexpectedly as far as I'm concerned, for, falling back by, uh, well, they're already six seconds behind. We've only got three laps in the book, so that uh, doesn't bode well for the Cadillacs in this race at the moment. But still... This is very early stages. Yeah, and we, we've got to be careful about trying to read too much into these situations. Again, remember what we said in our Porsche keys to the race. This is a fairly low grip circuit. And that, of course, means you use your tyres up if you're not sensible. I know it sounds odd, but uh, a high grip circuit normally means that you're not scrubbing so much tyres off. How does that work, kind of? I can hear you sing. Well, high grip circuit, the tyres stick, the air roll works, the car doesn't move around so much. A low grip circuit, the car slides because you're trying to take so much speed through the middle of the corners and you get that flat drift or sometimes even see the front or the rear starting to either push if it's the front, that's understeer, or get out of shape and oversteer at the back. When you do that, the tyres and the face of the tyre that's on the road instead of just pushing you forward is sliding sideways and at that point it's taking that rubber compound away from the tyre surface that's why you get all the bits of tyre debris offline that's what we call the marbles and that's why you wear your tyres more on a low grip circuit than on a high grip circuit now you can slightly mitigate that by being a bit careful about how you drive and the best drivers do that very well particularly in endurance racing here in IMSA, there's no real benefit to trying to double stint the tyres, but we might, towards the end of the race, once the teams have picked up a little bit of data on how the tyres are wearing, Jeremy Shaw, we might see a little splash of fuel where we only get two tyres on the left-hand side of the car, which is the the, car, the side of the uh, the tyres here that gets the, the most hit. That's not beyond the bounds of possibility, and we've seen one or two teams try that uh, sneaky tactic in the past yeah you're right you know there's some long uh, right hand corners here the carousel 
uh, the, uh, the the kink counter corner is, is a fair load as well. So the the, uh, the left hand side tyres certainly do take a bit more of a beating around here than the right side tyres. So that is certainly is an option for some of the teams at some stage. Now, a question coming in on at IMSA Radio on Twitter. Tracy said it looked like the number 55 took. Uh, the position from the number six before the start line. Will he get a penalty is, or is that allowed? On the green flag, Jeremy, can you overtake before the start line? Uh, the green flag, uh, you're not supposed to, no. Uh, that's, uh, that's for sure. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. I don't see anything on the race control uh, channel at the moment, but we will keep an eye on that. It is standard procedure that all of the starts are reviewed by race control. The other thing that they'll be looking for is track limits. Uh, it's always a bone of contention. Some people don't agree that track limits should be applied. I'm afraid I fall into the other camp and think that they should be applied probably more stringently uh, than they are. Here at Road America, IMSA have been uh, pretty strict this weekend. And there are a number of places, turn one in particular, Jeremy, uh, but also exiting the final corner and a couple of other places around the circuit, turn uh, number eight as well at the bottom of Harry Downs, where the drivers in the virtual driver's briefing before this weekend were told, guys, we're going to be looking, we know there's an advantage uh, to be had around there, uh, so you will be getting warned if you start taking liberties. Yeah, and uh, I'm... For me, a racetrack is built to race on, and if you need to use the, the environs around it, then uh, so be it. Uh, what I don't like these days is all the, the paved runoff areas we have. We have uh, so many different racetracks. Here, it's really just uh, turn one that uh, is an issue for, for in terms of track limits. The rest of the place uh, around the racetrack, you know, it, it's OK. Uh, but you, you can gain a, a large advantage doing that. And the reason they have these flat curbs that, uh, like at Turb 1 here, is mainly for the motorcycles that race on these racetracks as well. So I understand that, I get that, uh, but at the same time, uh, and, I, and, I, and I, particularly somewhere like Turn 1, I think it's good, but if you have it all the way around the racetrack, like somewhere like Circuit Americas, I think it's just ridiculous. So two hours and 28 minutes to go, the first 15 or so minutes have already disappeared into the history books and like the early rounds of a heavyweight boxing match it's all a bit of a jab and bob and weave just finding out where your competition are strong where you perhaps have an advantage gtd still has the two in vasa sullivan lexus at the lead aaron tealitz and frankie monte calvo now about four seconds ahead of robbie forley in the liquid molly uh, Turner Motorsport car. He's got half a second on Corey Fergus. He's having a great weekend for Compass McLaren. Carl Robinson in Riley Motorsports AMG GT3. Mercedes is another second and a half further back in GT Le Mans. Well, four car train heading up the hill towards the end of the lap at the moment, which is being led by uh, Bruno Spengler with Jesse Cron and Oli Gavin and Fred. Makovecki, all pretty much line astern there. Lawrence Vantour and Jordan Taylor just a little bit further uh, up the road. But this is good to see. BMW's looking a little more competitive than they have done in recent times, Jeremy. The Corvettes not having it their own, own way, and the Porsches, who looked strong in qualifying, not having it their own way either. No, that's true. The uh, BMWs have been got a, got a bit of a break in terms of the balance of performance since the race at sea. We've got a bit more horsepower. Should be as much as 14 horsepower. That's a spin for number 18. That is uh, Dwight Merriman, who's a re doing a really good job hanging on to the tail and challenging Henrik Hedman for second place. But unfortunately now, he's going to lose a lot of ground with that spin. That was the LMP2 third place car. Uh, Kyle Tilly joining Dwight Merriman in the Aero Motorsport uh, machine. He's lost a bit of ground, but plenty of time to make it up. And already, even on this long track, we've got Lappery going on by the leaders. Ricky yes. Taylor and Dame Cameron going through the GT Le Mans runners. And Harry Tinknell's used that opportunity to gain on them the dark red first of the Mazdas. They're top four almost together heading through turn five and up towards the Corvette Bridge at turn six. And this is starting to get interesting. And this, Jeremy, is where, if you are chasing, you want to be as close as you can to those leading two Acuras, just in case there's a little fumble, little schmozzle that gives you the opportunity to make a pass. 
round. Yeah, exactly right, John. And uh, the, the two Accus had been separated by about a second and a half. Similar gap back to the Mazda. We look at, uh, have a replay of what happened to Dwight Merrin. Just got on the, on the gas a little bit too... Uh, too hard there and uh, around that car goes so that's unfortunate for him but he's going to get that car going again but that gap from first to second to third absolutely disappeared as the leaders started to work their way through the GTD cars. I think the Acura drivers in particular being a little bit more cautious because they had the lead yes. but uh, they come out of it uh, still in first and second positions and now they'll have some, some clear track for a while once they're now past all the GTD cars they can concentrate on keeping that clean race so uh, good sensible driving by both of these two and as you say the, the mouse is hanging in there the, the Cadillacs are still slipping back five and a half seconds back to the fifth place and the best place the Cadillacs, that is Ryan Briscoe, who is now under pressure from Felipe Nasser. I just uh, had a little bit of a word with one or two of the Cadillac teams, I won't say which ones, but there was some thought that they felt they didn't have the outright pace here to challenge the Acuras, uh, or indeed the Mazdas, but the Acuras in particular, and I just wonder if already there's some different tactics going on in terms of fuel saving and a bit of let's go as long as we can in the race and see what we get later on by the Cadillac runners. It's not the usual modus operandi from those guys. As the Just having a quick look back at the start and there did seem to be a bit of shuffling of position before the start line itself, particularly in GT Le Mans. It was the... Uh, Porsche and the Corvette on the front row and who got across the line first looked to me as though the Corvette got across the line in front of the Porsche and some thought that there might have been some overtaking further towards the front of the race, that is being looked at by race control at the moment, uh, just a quick hello as well to Mike Roberts who's in Chase 3 parked up at the motorcycle chicane just on the exit of the carousel says to us keep up the great work everyone I should say the same to you uh, Mike and your colleagues I really hope you have absolutely nothing to do this afternoon and I say that in the nicest possible way but uh, thank you to all of the corner workers rescue recovery track services and everybody uh, including the people who help you park your cars punch your tickets etc who make a race Weekends like this IMSA Road Race Showcase at Road America actually happen. We can't go racing without you. And all around the world, we need more corner workers. Go and find out about it. If you're a race fan, give something back. It's not about taking cool photographs because you're at the side of the track because you don't have time for that. You're doing a job. You're keeping the racing going. And we always need more people to help out. So if you're interested in that, SCCA and other marshalling organisations in the States and the British Motor Racing Marshals Club uh, here in the UK, various places in Europe as well, that you can go online, go and search it and give something back to the sport that we all love. From uh, Harry Tinkle, I think, wasn't it, in the, the lead Mazda at Turn 5, John, but he's able to uh, keep his position. Uh, Tristan Nunez right behind him in the white car as opposed to the, uh, the sole red uh, Mazda number 55 which is in third position these two uh, Ricky Taylor just stretched his lead on that last lap out to a second and a half he's got good pace in that car the previous uh, two or three laps while they were negotiating the GTD cars their lap times had fallen to high one minute 55s uh, now with a clear track again oh it's 52 last time around what 51.55 is the fastest lap of the race so far that compares to the uh, lap record here, which was set last year by Oliver Jarvis, a 51.1. Also a good lap from Patrick Kelly, who continues to extend his lead in LMP2 now, out to over 13 seconds. Uh, this is an action replay of Sebring for Patrick Kelly. Uh, back in motor racing after a little time away and thoroughly enjoying uh, his competitive career again just a little bit of a break going on at Ricky Taylor at the front has now pulled out a second and a half from his teammate Dame Cameron who's still got Harry Tignall and Tristan Nunez in pretty close accompaniment as they head down to turn one again 
turning into there. Turn one, you take so much speed into the apex there. Can't take too much of the curb on the inside or indeed the outside. And the runoff ends rather abruptly there as well. Turn three, run out to the yellow and red curbs and then down the middle straight, if you will. There is a little kink in the middle of it, which is turn termed as turn four, but really... It's a flat-out blast down to turn five. You crest the brow, and then you've got to pick your braking spot. Good to watch to the right-hand side where the curbs start. That gives you an idea of where you are, particularly if you're right up the rear aerofoil of somebody else. Turn six is over the top of a brow, just under the bridge, and again, you've got to know where you're going there. Seven, real leap of faith. Turn in, hammer the curb on the right-hand side. Another over the top of the brow entry to turn number eight. Nice wide runoff there, but... It, if you go too wide, you've got to lift off because, again, the grass comes up to you very quickly. Then it's the carousel balancing the car with the throttle, with the steering, feeling for the grip from the tyres and the aero. And more lappery now as the GT Le Mans leading cars are about to go a lap down. So Ricky Taylor has got his brother ahead of him now in the Corvette that leads GT Le Mans. He's already dealt with Lawrence Van Tour as he heads down towards Canada Corner. It's busy, you know, it is busy around here, considering it's a four-mile lap around Jeremy Thorpe Shaw, but with four different classes, even with, and I say only advisedly, it's a great entry. IMSA have done a cracking job, and thanks to all the teams for supporting it. But even with 30 cars here, it's still a busy lap, isn't it? Yeah, it is, and, uh, yeah, and you, as we said already, you can easily lose for the prototype cars, they can easily lose three or four seconds a lap negotiating some of the slower cars here but the two masses absolutely tied together that was an eight car rt24p heading towards turn one but just harry tignall able to maintain his advantage over over tristan nunez running very very wide there in turn one to do so yeah the rt p24 mazda's dpi contender just a four-cylinder in-line turbocharged two-litre engine. And here comes Harry Tinknell. He's got a run. And it was the BMW who unwittingly helped him. He'll have to go all the way around the outside at turn five. And he gives it up for the moment. But he'll cut back to the inside. The BMW number 25, Bruno Spengler, is the next car up the road. And that might, again, give him a little bit of assistance. No, he's had... Oh, well, yes. Just for a moment, I thought that Dan Cameron was going to get through and Tinknell briefly on one of the splits was scored in second place as they head through Harry Downs and into turn eight. And just sitting off the back of this, biding his time, Tristan Nunez, I think driving a very, very sensible race, Jeremy. He's dropped sometimes four, five, six car lengths back from the two cars ahead of him when he's been in traffic, but he's easily able to make that back. I think he's got a good car underneath him at the moment, Tristan. I agree with you, and driving it uh, very nicely in the early stages of the race here, he's got to be... The, the, the guys have got to realise, you know, it's a two-hour and 40-minute race, there's lots that can go on, and probably going to be... If we go green all the way, there'll be four pit stops, so a lot of strategy to be played out during this race, and, you know, if you get held up like that, you, you have to tuck him behind a, a slower car for one corner, don't worry about it, because you'll probably uh, have the, the same problem with the other car, but the next one is exactly what happened there, heading into turn 14. Well, held up just a little bit. This is the and of course, they are teammates, so there's no sense in fighting. If Harry thinks that he needs to give best, he might just lift off. Tristan's got his nose ahead at the moment, and Harry just stays to the inside, kicks up a bit of dust. Tristan goes through. I would suggest had that been another manufacturer, that might have been made a little more difficult there. <laughs> uh, I agree with you. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting yeah, driving between those two, and you know, they were they were absolutely side by side. And I wonder whether uh, Harry, whether he decided on his own or whether he got a call for the pit lane, just let Tristan go at this stage. Again, long, long way to go. So you know, no point in doing silly. Good driving from both of those two Mazda teammates. Uh, yes, and, and I. I think, as I say, that Tristan may just have a wee better car uh, at the moment, and there could be slight nuances of differences between the setup of those two two cars. Uh, they're running the same Michelin slick tyre. We'll see how that plays out later on. Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuel Pit and Paddock reporter, has been trawling around for some uh, information. JT Le Mans, Shea, I am noticing a sort of a split between the two cars and each of the manufacturer's teams. Do we think there's something going on there, or is that just how it's turned out? 
Well, if you remember back to the Daytona race, the WeatherTech 240 in July, Corvette split their strategy, sending one car out on a plan to run full rich the whole way and hope that there would be a yellow. The other car being a little bit more conservative. It wound up being the car that was a bit more conservative that came home with the win. That was ultimately the number three. Today, it looks like the number three is the car that is sent out to go as fast as it can, while the number four is on perhaps a bit more of a fuel safe strategy. That's also the case for the number 912 and 911 Porsches. The 912 of Lawrence Vantor, less than half a second off the back of Jordan Taylor, is fighting for the lead at the uh, right. And well, the 911 of Fred McBeck, well, he's trying to see if he can squeeze an extra lap out of the tank. Yeah, and, 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 and in fairness, Fred hasn't been here for a little while. Uh, certainly, that's a, a new car to, a relatively new car to the championship. It wouldn't be the first time we've seen that happen, Shea. Thank you uh, for that. And, and it's kind of covering all bases. Jeremy and I want to see this race run for the next two hours and 15 minutes without the intervention of the uh, C8 uh, safety car, Corvette. But that might not happen. We've got to face the fact, Jeremy, it might not happen. And if you've got two bullets in the gun, then you can split that strategy. You can. Uh, the, the fact that, uh, uh, that the, the cars have been given a little bit more fuel for this race uh, to try and equalise equalize the, the length they're going to stay to. So they're going to sort of minimise the effect of that sort of strategy. But certainly, you know, by, even by saving any fuel at all, uh, it, it's a benefit because you have to put in less, less fuel and maybe at the final stop. So right. it does give you a, a bit more flexibility having a, a fuel margin here rather than being stretched uh, in terms of your fuel consumption, how far you can go on the tank. This way you can stretch it out a little bit if, you, if you've got a really soft right foot. Maybe you'd make a little bit less fuel, slightly faster bit stop, maybe, maybe make that pass in the pit lane. Battle for the lead in GT. Le Mans is turned up to 11 at the moment. It's 13th and 14th position for Jordan Taylor and Lawrence Van Ter. Lawrence paired with Earl Bamber, who's announced this week he'll be doing a couple of, uh, or at least one, Xfinity race, Richard Childress uh, racing, jumping in to uh, help him, and that is going to be on the modified Daytona uh, circuit, road circuit that uh, happens later on this year. And from what I'm hearing, Shea, that might not be the, first, the, the last time that we see Bambi in a, in a Chevrolet. He might, uh, uh, well, he might actually get another shot at uh, driving the Bortite. Yeah, he's had a, quite a long relationship with Holden, at the very least, running down as Shane Van Gisbergen's teammate in the Virgin Australia Supercar Championship. But he has long wanted to drive in NASCAR. Everybody thinks of Nick Tandy associated with his love of NASCAR. It is effervescent with Earl Bamber, too. And the first time that he's actually going to get to drive the Xfinity car will be leaving the pit lane for the start of the race. So it's going to be a very interesting experience for Bambi. First time driving the car, but he knows the track, whereas pretty much everyone else in the series knows the car, but not the track. Oh, is that one of the events where there's no practice or qualifying? There are no more practice or qualifying sessions for any more NASCAR events throughout the remainder of their championship for all three series. It's the way to go racing, Jeremy. That's what you do when you race your wonderful uh, MX-5 Miata. Uh, and it's basically get in and get on with it. Uh, the getting on with it at the moment it is uh, Tristan Nunes, who's uh, looking very ca carefully at the back of a, an Acura. And they're heading down towards turn number uh, uh, turn down towards Canada Corner at the moment, cutting their way through traffic. The forward vision in the Mazda through the uh, the, the tear offs that are on the front screen aren't great, isn't great there. It almost looks like it's steamed up a bit, but I, I don't think it is. I just think there's a little bit of air gap between the different layers. Right, who was that that was pitting uh, in front of the leaders? I think. It was Dave Yes, it was. It was the Aero Motorsport, the Merriman car, diving into the pits. Uh, we have got 30 minutes on the clock. So that's a little bit early. Uh, let's go back this year, Adam, for a VP Racing Fuels update. Well, it started out as an intent to save fuel, but unfortunately for the Ford Corvette, they are now battling more issues. There's an electronic bug within the car that's causing some traction control issues, among other things. So the team is trying to figure out a way for all the 
drive around that. But right now, that is part of the reason the lap times are dropping off for Ollie. Ever the professional, though, he's trying to figure out a way to fix it while driving. Yeah, how many buttons do you need to press? Half an hour gone, this is how it stands. Acura and Ricky Taylor in the seven car, 4.1 seconds ahead of his teammate in the six car. That's Dean Cameron, half a second ahead at the line, at least, of the now number 77 in third position. Tristan Nunes having uh, taken over that position from his teammate a couple of laps ago going around the outside into turn one. Harry Tinkle remains in fourth position in the dark red number 55, just a tenth or so back from his teammate, the best of the Cadillacs, another three seconds back down the road. But starting, and that's very interesting, we need to keep an eye on the lap times for the Cadillacs. Ryan Briscoe did a 55.7 last time around. The top three are all doing 56 and a halfs. So are the Cadillacs beginning to get into their stride as the fuel burns off and we're half an hour into the stint? Then it's Nazir for Wheeland, Barboza for Mustang Sampling and Chris Miller for GDC. Patrick Kelly leads by an increasing margin in LMP2 over Henrik Hedman and Caliburn Castles with the era car having already pulled into the pit lane uh, for presumably for an early service. GT Le Mans, Corvette versus Porsche by half a second. Taylor Van Tour, three and nine, one, two. Spengler's only a second or so further back in the first of the BMWs, uh, and then its teammate is second. And as the leader, uh, leading prototype start to their pit lane, uh, start to come in the pit lane, it's Aaron Tielitz and Frankie Montecalvo, who for the 14 and the 12 lead, GT Daytona for Ian Vassar Sullivan ahead of Robbie Foley, who's six seconds further back for Turner BMW. Shea, you have the 55 Mazda in the pit lane, and Joao Barbosa in the number five Cadillac. It's going to be a driver change for the 55 Mazda, even though having taken the start of the race, and with only 30 minutes elapsed, this is quite a bit earlier than we expected to see this Mazda into the pits as is Jonathan getting in or is he just doing a drinks bottle change? He thought actually installing himself into the car, the light blue helmet still around the driver's side, but the driver's door open as the fuel and tires is done and a quick clean off of the windshield. Joao Barbosa is in and that looks like Seb Bourdais' helmet. Let's just make sure that he is actually getting in the car and not trying to trick us once again. As they clean off the grill, having completed the left side tire change, uh, no, that's still Barbosa behind the wheel, so no driver change for the five either. There is a minimum drive time, but that only applies to LMP2 and GTD in terms of needing 45 minutes. For the DPI and GTLM categories, it's only 10 minutes, so they could have done a driver change. Service is done on the Mustang sampling Cadillac, and it rolls back out. But that's very curious as to what was going on with the Mazda, because that was not the stop that I was expecting. Now that is interesting, Jeremy, and our Porsche keys to the race we mentioned uh, expecting around about four pit stops for uh, those guys. Um, that's half an hour, and uh, that is a tiny bit earlier than I would have thought. You do use fuel here at a, at a frightening rate because you're on the throttle and on full throttle so much uh, of the time as the leader comes into uh, the pit lane. What do we reckon, Jeremy? Is that a little bit early, or are you relatively happy with that? No, I was surprised to see it coming. I was, I was just about to say it was going to be another lap or maybe maybe two before we see the leaders into the pit lane. There's a mistake by the Corvette. I'm wondering how the number 912 got past the, to the lead in GTL, and that's what happened, that's what happened at turn seven. But here, I was going to say, here we are now. Uh, and what was interesting, I was suggesting maybe somebody's trying to go a lap longer than, than some of the other contenders, but here's the leader onto pit lane. It's both of the Acura Shea, and Shea is watching with our VP Racing Fuels pit lane update. VP Fuels pit lane racing update. Fuel going into both of the Acuras is fuel and tires for both the seven and the six. It's still Ricky Taylor and Dane Cameron behind the wheel for those. I didn't see a driver change for either. They were followed in by Tristan Nunez in the 77 Mazda and Tristan is out of that car. I see Oliver Jarvis now installed behind the wheel with the bright pink helmet. No, he was also doing the same service that was going on in the 55. So both of the second drivers for the Mazdas employed during those pit stops, but not what they're normally used to doing. Also into the pit lane was the 85. That's the banana boat. Chris Miller started that car. He is sharing with Tristan Bodier, but we'll have to wait and see if it was a driver change. And staying out the lap longer hasn't worked for the 77. The 55's back around, so the performance potential unlocked with the new Michelin tyres just one lap earlier has worked for Harry Tinknell, so good in lap and out lap. I think both of the Acuras did get through uh, did get out in front of Harry. We've got Ryan Briscoe leading the race. 
uh, with the Cunningham and Alta Cadillac, the glossy black car. He's got Philippe Nazet right behind him. As there's oh, there's a touch going up the hill, and there's damage to the left rear of the number seven, Ricky Taylor. Uh, Acura. He pulled across out of turn five to block the Mazda going up the hill, and he's slowing. There look, looks to be a puncture, I think, on that. Acura as it's in the hurry downs now. Excuse me, it was the number six car. It was Dan Cameron's car. As in come the two leading Cadillacs. Wayne Taylor Racing and Action Express are coming into the pit lane, but one of the leaders already with a problem, trailing some bodywork. And yeah, it's a left rear puncture caused by the impact going up the hill to turn number six. Shea Adam has the two Cadillacs. Fuel and tires for the Whalen Engineering Cadillac and also a wing adjustment. So they're making a little bit of a change as far as the rear downforce is concerned for that Felipe Custer based number 31 Cadillac. For the 10, fuel and tires, a bit of a slower stop as that car still looks beautiful and pristine. I do not see the bright yellow helmet of Ranger Van de Zanda, so I'm assuming that it's still Ryan Pisco, winner of the race the last two years in the GT Le Mans category for Ford, just waiting on fuel, so a perfect stop at the Conic Minolta crew. Should always be the fuel that is the determining factor, and it just sneaks out ahead of the 31 wheel and Cadillac that it was battling before, and they drop in uh, behind the cars that made the pit stops earlier. So Ricky Taylor now leads from Harry Tinknell and Tristan Nunez because of the incident going up the hill. There was a slight mistake. Ah, that's what it was. There was a slight mistake uh, from Dan Cameron at turn five. He ran wide, realised he'd lost momentum, and chopped across to the left-hand side, where, unfortunately, Harry... Tinknell was already on that part of the road and then he had another go at him as well trying to block him coming out of turn number seven that's a bit naughty by Dean there lost momentum yes but can't just go across to the left and block and he did exactly the same coming out of turn seven drifts wide oh well maybe Harry was a little bit more to blame for the other one but uh, that's made a bad situation worse there Jeremy and that's a new... It, it certainly has, yes, you're absolutely right there, John, and uh, it, he, uh, he uh, is going to lose a lot of time with having to limp all the way, well, what, two-thirds of the way around this four-mile racetrack. And he's also going to lose more time. It's been, uh, he's been apportioned incident responsibility for that uh, move across the track. And so he, once he's had his service and had the rear end of that car replaced and they've checked to make sure everything's safe he's going to have to come in on pit lane again and that is going to probably drop him in fact it will Jeremy won't it drop him off the lead lap in DPI yeah it will it's what we were talking about in Porsche keys to the race you know sometimes you've got to know which battles to fight he'd made a little mistake at turn five but but that you know he might have lost the lead but he would have still been fighting a couple of corners later when he cleaned his Michelin tyres up he'd have been fine but this way, he's just lost the lead lap. Uh, and that really doesn't help the team at all. And it certainly doesn't help himself. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, and uh, that's kind of surprising there, isn't it? Very it surprising. In, in GTLM, by the way, because the uh, number three car, uh, first of all, we saw it being overtaken by the number 912 Porsche. He's also now fallen behind Bruno Spengler. So Jordan Taylor back to third position in the class, and now he's got a train of cars behind him. He's got uh, Jesse Crone and Fred Bakovecki. Oliver Gavin also has slipped back in the other Corvette. He's now running a couple or three seconds behind the rest of the back pack in GTLM. That's curious. Hearing from Shea Adam, who's speaking to the team, that they are getting a tyre drop-off degradation on the tyres uh, on the GTLM cars. Uh, more than they had been expecting. It's uh, 45 Celsius on the track, so that is getting very toasty indeed for those Michelin slicks. Uh, that is 115 Fahrenheit on the track, and that means that rubber is working very, very hard indeed. They're relatively heavy, powerful racing cars, and although they do have traction control to help stop the wheel spin and preserve the tyre life there's only so much you can do with electronics Jeremy and you can't overcome physics at the end of the day this may require a little bit of a rethink on the strategy for the GT Le Mans cars if they're going to keep the performance levels up towards the end of the race 
that's uh, that, yeah, that's right. That's certainly interesting because uh, yesterday in qualifying, it seemed the Corvettes were really good on their tyres. But of course, because of that, they did a, they did a long stint in their qualifying runs yesterday, didn't they? Much more than either Porsche or or BMW, and that I think is coming back to haunt them now. And perhaps be, they should be in better shape in the later stages of the race. They've got to hope now they don't too much, lose too much ground in this middle part. And don't forget, Oli Gavin also fighting some kind of uh, unspecified, uh, at least we don't have the full details, but some kind of electrical issue in that car uh, as well. And that may well be causing other related issues. Well, we've had the first 40 minutes. We're coming down to two hours. The front of the field, Acura holds sway, but only just by about half a second with the... Number seven, Ricky Taylor, Acura Team Penske, DPI, ahead of the dark red 55. Then it's two seconds further back to the white Mazda. So 55 Mazda from 77 Mazda. And here is the number four car into the pit lane. That is the Oli Gavin car. And sorry, it's the number three car. My apologies. That is the Jordan Taylor car. Share Adam. Jordan out of the car and walking very close back over to the pit wall is now Antonio Garcia is being strapped in for his first stint around Road America. Interesting that neither Antonio nor Jordan has ever won at Road America in IMSA competition. Oh no, a bad stop from Corvette Racing. The Field Pro came out long before the tires were completed and now they lost time even as Antonio was trying to engage the car in gear to get it rolling. That was about five seconds lost total between the field probe coming out and the car moving again. That's a very rare day when Corvette racing makes a mistake on a pit stop. Yeah, that is true. And in our Porsche keys to the race, we mentioned this. You're going to be in the pit lane a couple of three, possibly even four times for the front running cars and DPI today. And you really can't afford those little fumbles, it's hot, it's humid, it's going to be difficult for the pit crews in their fireproof suit. Down the inside for the 911 at Canada Corner. And Fred Makovecki goes ahead of Jesse Krohn in a pass for position. Rather took Jesse by surprise there. Uh, that uh, will be third position then for Makovecki as he has cleared off immediately from the RLL number 24 BMW as the comes across the line right now well that was a very odd one they were in traffic but that seemed very easy indeed Jeremy Shaw for Fred Makovecki who'd been sort of cruising around at the back might that BMW is quick in a straight line though closes right back yeah. up again as they come towards the first corner nestled as they are in between two of the MSR GT3 the GT Daytona NSX's I'm not sure what was going on there with Jesse Cron maybe he didn't see the white Porsche coming yeah, I'm not sure. Strange. The number six car, by the way, is back into the pit lane. So Jordan Taylor clearly more problems on that. Uh, Dane Cameron, excuse me, uh, more problems with that car after the incident uh, oh. a little earlier. Oh, this is probably the drive-through, of course, though, isn't it? Yes, it Good is. Point. So uh, that'll lose him more. He's already, I think, a lap off the pace. Uh, so he's pretty much out of contention. There's somebody flying off the road. Was that the? Yes, it is. That's number 18. That's the LMP2. Yeah, number 18 car. Yeah. yeah. In, uh, uh, in LMP2, by the way, Patrick Kelly, he's continuing to, tur to turn fast fast laps, extending his lead now over Henry Hedman to over 40 seconds. Uh, that's right, Merriman, and he'd already been on the grass, Jeremy, halfway down the straight uh, as he was passing cars. He got a little tap from the uh, BMW and got his left side the tyres are fairly dirtied up there, and I, I'm sure that didn't help, but he still seemed to be approaching turn five uh, rather uh, too quickly to get around it. Managed not to hit the concrete wall on driver's uh, right, but picking his way through traffic, had to go one way, then the other, and I think just got a little nudge by the number 24. It was the uh, 57 NSX... Uh, MSR NXX, uh, Misha Goikberg that he was going by as well at the time picking his way through and that's what set that whole thing in motion but as I say, he wasn't getting that stop for turn 5, uh, not this Sunday, not in a month of Sundays uh, to, be, to be quite honest so early pit stop then for the uh, Corvette number 3 and that's dropped that car down, Tonio Garcia now in that car Let's see how that one plays out. Hearing from a couple of people at the circuit, there's one or two spots of very light rain uh, around 
the circuit at the moment. And uh, drive through penalty has happened. Into the pit lane now comes the 85, Tristan Vautier. And Shea Adam uh, has uh, a speeding, pit lane speeding penalty. So this is another uh, pit lane violation for the number 85, JDC Cadillac, which is driving through pit lane at the moment. And Shea Adam, that stop for the number three car for uh, which uh, Antonio Garcia took over from Taylor. Now, was that a problem? Was it that they were running short of fuel? Was it something else? It was a problem in the fact that the tire degradation was much higher than they were expecting on that car. So the car had just become undrivable for Jordan. It reached the point where they were losing too many positions and they decided to commit for new tires. But it might have been a little bit too soon, John, because there is a giant pop of thunderstorm that has just appeared between Manitowoc and the racetrack and is rapidly approaching Sheboygan. So we could be getting rain a lot sooner than at the end of the hour. OK, thank you. Mm. That's, that's not good. Well, uh, a couple of very quick laps lately, John. Uh, the race leader uh, is car number seven, that's Ricky Taylor. He set a new lap record uh, a couple of laps ago at a 151.38. That was immediately bettered by the number 77 car, Tristan Munez, 151.29. Uh, on this most recent lap, Ricky Taylor had gone uh, a new personal best, 31.43, and that gap between first and second now, which Ricky Taylor and Harry Tignall is out to almost two seconds, and Tristan Nunez has similar margin back in third. Ryan Presco, the best of the Corvettes, actually edging away a little bit from Felipe Nasser. He's about 10 seconds behind the Corvette car. It's Jeremy Shaw, who joins me, John Heindorf, in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre window open for GTD pit stops and we're also going to see the more regular stops as well I think for GT Le Mans not too far away and in fact uh, first of the GTD front runners to make its pit stop is the Turner Motorsports number 96 BMW Shea Adam is watching this this is a car that was damaged yesterday after a piece of debris cut a brake line, resulting in a total loss of brake pressure for Robbie Foley entering turn five. It was quite the moment for Robbie and quite the shunt. The crew worked and had it fully repaired for qualifying. Now watch Rob because he's going to limp away from the car. The reason we have Robbie Foley in racing is because he used to be a football player. He got a bad injury to his leg that resulted in him not being able to play football anymore and was offered an opportunity by his dad. If he recovered, he could start racing. Well, yesterday in the crash, it dislocated Robbie's bad knee again. He said he's having trouble walking, but he was just fine to drive a race. If you want to talk about grit and determination, how about the Turner Motorsports boys? 96 services done, fuel tires, and fill power. Now, we all also into the pit lane was the 74 Mercedes for Riley Technologies. Riley, who's won here twice in the last six years. Lawson Oshabach taking over for Gar Robinson. Misha Goikberg brought in the number 57 MSR Acura, as did Matt McMurray bringing in the 86 MSR Acura. They'll both be handing over to Al Perrent and Mario Farnbacher, respectively. And the last car to follow its way into the pit lane was Ryan Hart with the number 16 Wright Motorsport Porsche. He'll be handing over to Patrick Long. Light spots of... Thank you, Shea Adam, for that uh, VP Racing Fuels uh, update. Light spots of rain started about three or four minutes ago at Canada Corner, according to Paul Marquardt at IMSA Radio. Thank you, Paul, for that. JDC, the 85 car, Tristan Fortier doing a bit of rally crossing, oh. coming out of Turn 7. Not the first person we've seen uh, doing that. Uh, this weekend oh. either if you're at the track 87.7 FM uh, Sirius 219 XM202 no blocks uh, no interruptions all the way through the race and of course uh, around the world on RS2 the home of IMSA radio if you're in the uh, US NBC have your coverage Calvin Fish and the rest of the team calling that from up at Charlotte and the around the rest of the world if there's no network tv coverage then imsa.tv or the live player at radio-show.co.uk and again those international streams have no breaks we go flag to flag for every one of the imsa events that we cover so well jeremy under two hours now gt Daytona 
lead is in. We'll let, Eve, uh, we'll let Shear just keep a, an eye uh, on the number 12 car and its stop, and it's already rolling again. It's been a very interesting uh, opening set of, uh, of laps and an opening stanza uh, for this two hour and 40 minute race. And I, I get the feeling that there's more playing out than we're seeing at the moment, if I'm honest. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, it's certainly interesting to see the uh, pace of Ricky Taylor. He's uh, looking good at the front of the field. He's managing his, his car very, very well, but uh, he's trying to be cautious in the traffic, which is which is pretty sensible. And that has enabled Harry Tinknell to close in again. The gap was uh, a couple of seconds, just a couple of laps again. Now, as you can see, as they head toward the kink, it's uh, just over a second. It's much, much closer than it was. So. Uh, I think, you know, it's it's kind of been a cat and mouse at this stage in the race. Uh, and uh, we'll be pit stops. We're about a, about uh, eight and, we're halfway through this stint, let's say. So a long way to go. There's a pit stop for Robbie Foley. Uh, that's in the most what BMW. Yeah, that and happened a wee while ago, uh, Jeremy. Yeah. Yeah, OK. Um, and he lived away from that. I can't even imagine Three, doing anything ago, you're right. with a, a, a leg injury in a racing car. You, there's so much pressure that you're putting on the the pedals, particularly the brake pedals uh, on a car now, you're absolutely hammering that. I mean, it's his right leg, so probably he's left foot braking on that car, but that's still his throttle leg. But uh, that must be terribly uncomfortable. Bill Orbelin uh, looking to break a significant record again this weekend. If he's going to do it, he's got to beat not one, but two of these Lexus at uh, Jeremy Shaw. Indeed, and this is the second, the, the, the other Lexus was in the previous lap. Frankie Montecarver out of that car, handing over to Townsend Bell. There was about uh, three seconds between the perils and before this round of pit stops, and they had edged away to the tune of almost 10 seconds ahead of Robbie Foley before we saw the turn of motorsport BMW make its pit stop a couple of laps ago. That's left the Compass Racing. Uh, McLaren at the head of the field, but that car hasn't stopped. Tealitz. Uh, uh, in the pits, uh, Cooper McNeil in the pits, Rob Furriol uh, in the pits as well. T Bell is on his way around. Let's see where he is. Here he comes. This is going to be, well, it's not not even tight, really. That's he it. will be by the time they get down to the back straight, I think, because uh, Townsend's on, on, uh, on soft tyres. But there's the advantage of staying out one more lap yeah. for... Uh, for a Townsend Bell, he's on uh, on hot tyres. Aaron Tillits comes out. His tyres are cooled right down. He's going to close up as they head down the back straight. It'll be interesting to see whether there is a challenge. This is for the well, it's not for, it's not for the lead at the moment because Corey Fergus hasn't yet stopped in that Compass McLaren. So good fuel economy there from the uh, Compass Racing entry. And we are heading down towards Turn Five as we see the GTLM leader headed to the pit lane. And Hawksworth does make the pass at Turn Five as Jeremy said he jumped in to replace Aaron Tealitz. In comes the 9-1-2 of Lawrence Van Tour. Uh, and in second place, Fred Makovecki uh, for the 911 Porsche. So he's worked his way through. And this looks like full service. Shea Adam has this VP Racing Fuels pit lane update. Earl Bamber with a different Hans device than he normally wears. I noticed uh, the straps across his back gets into the number 912 Porsche. Lawrence Fantor runs over to the pit wall and prepares to take his helmet off and get comfy because we don't normally see Lawrence get back into the car. He drove a lot longer than he had expected in the race at Sebring, but he does his normal first stint and then bail out. And so life has returned to normal for the G defending GTLM champions. Fuel and tires, a perfect tire stop for the guys. Well done for the and away goes uh, Earl, taking over from Larry. Nearly collides with the number four Corvette, though, trying to come into its pit box. That's Ollie Gavin getting out. And now it's time for Tommy Milner, fuel and tires for that four Corvette. We'll see if they do anything to try and indicate an issue with that electric problem going on inside the cockpit of the number four Corvette. But I don't see the passenger door coming open, so I don't think they're doing anything to try and rectify it. Maybe Ollie was able to get his head wrapped around it while he was driving and fix it for his co-driver, Tommy, who, by the way, he and his wife, Laura, are expecting their new first born child any day now. So congrats to Laura as fuel pressure comes out. Once again, with some time. Time firing up the car and getting it going. That was about two seconds lost for the four Corvette as opposed to the problems that we see for the number three. I just wonder, Shea, and this might be something you can ask the team, uh, whether um, Earl Bamba, that, that strap, version of the head and neck restraint uh, device. No, normally it's a, a carbon fibre collar that fastens on 
to your helmet, but the strap version is what I've seen stock car drivers use uh, rather than the, the sports car or the single-seater version. And I just wonder if Earl is trying that out and getting comfortable with it before that Xfinity race that we were talking about earlier on. My thoughts, exactly. Uh, but he does have a Darren's helmet coming for that race as well. So it's a, a bit of a slow learning process, still using a sports car helmet with his uh, now NASCAR Hans device. He's still going to have to get used to a new one too. Yeah, OK. I presume he's going to have a slightly different design so he can see a little bit better. A couple of laps ago, the number 12, uh, T-Bell, went past Hawksworth uh, and took over the lead of GTD after the first round of pit stops. It was a close run thing, but as Jeremy suggested, he was absolutely right. Townsend Bell, with an extra lap of heat and pressure into his Michelin tyres, was able to make the pass. Again, I will make the point that was a team car. And again, I would expect that if that had been a Ferrari or a, a Turner Motorsport BMW or Riley Motorsports, McLaren, uh, Marion Motorsports Mercedes or indeed a Compass Race and McLaren, that might have been made a little more difficult. But at the end of that first round of pit stops, Jeremy, for, for GT Daytona, uh, the gap between the two in Vatha Sullivan uh, Lexus RCF GT3 cars and the rest of the field is 16 seconds. So they've lost absolutely nothing at all of the advantage before that round of pit stops. No, they well the the, the, the two. Uh, excuse last me, time it's four around, and a half seconds. Yeah, four and a yeah, half, half seconds. Excuse seconds. me. So it actually has closed. Yes, up, it has. Uh, My apologies. Over what it was before, and that earlier pit stop for Bill Aubrey, and he's able to turn some very quick laps. He's just turned his best lap of the race actually at a 208.8. Uh, Bill Aubrey having taken over from Robbie Foy, so he's only four and a half seconds behind the two Lexus is 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 is, and a new fastest lap of the race in GTD on the previous lap by Lawson Aschenbach who's now up into fourth place ahead of uh, Paul Holton in the McLaren. That's the car that's just been uh, that led for a lap before being the, the last of the GTD leaders to come onto the pit lane. Remember, 87.7 FM this weekend around the circuit at uh, Road America. And uh, thanks to Paul Markart for letting us know what the weather is doing at the moment. We've seen no intensification of those drops of rain from a little while ago. At IMSA Radio, if you want to get in touch with us, as the number seven Acura drops down to turn number five. It's now pulled out nearly a second more than we were talking about before from the 55 of Harry Tinkler. It's just over a second now. It's about half a second. It's now 1.2. So yeah. starting to get into his stride, Ricky Taylor here. Well, uh, and the other man is not far behind either. I mean, the, the, the gap between the, between the top three cars, it was kind of four seconds. It's less than that now. It's only two and a half or so. But again, you know, that's the vagaries of working their way through the traffic. And uh, all of the, the DPI leaders have been pretty circumspect in the traffic. And that is, you know, that's, that's a smart thing to do. But as we've seen uh, so often in the past, uh, that's not often sometimes not how these guys drive. Yeah, no. Uh, LM, the LMP2 stops have happened, but Patrick Kelly has stayed behind the wheel. And Cameron Castles has stayed behind the wheel as well. No, he didn't start the race in the 30 year, did he? Um, uh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he, yes, did. he did. Yeah, yeah. all right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, ben Handy, though, has taken over from Henrik Hedman uh, and is now just set the fastest lap of the race in LMP2. But he's back in third position, uh, quite a long way behind. He's about uh, ooh, yeah, a long way back in second place in the class. 21 seconds or, or more than that, actually. Just a... Just a quick note on the uh, Corvette uh, pit stop that we thought took a little bit longer. Actually, Adam was watching Tommy Milner getting in as Ollie got out of the number four car. Alan Prosser, uh, who is king of the screen grabs, offers this on at IMSA Radio, and I'll retweet that as well so you can have a look at what he's sent us. He says, I reckon Ollie got a bit too close to the uh, wall on the right hand side, and the right side tyre changes didn't quite have enough room to get the wheel off 
whilst the tyre changer was there. Still managed to get it done, but it cost them a bit of time. Good spot, Alan, thank you, and I like that. Uh, in comes, we see clearly listening on 87.7 FM uh, at uh, PR1 Matheson Motorsport because Patrick Kelly, Shea Adam, has come into the pit lane. He has, and he's sharing with uh, Simon Tremor, who hasn't driven this car since Daytona. So it's been a little while, and I, I don't mean the Daytona that happened about a month ago. I mean the Daytona that happened about seven months ago. So we welcome back Simon Tremor to the series and to the PR1 Matheson team, and we congratulate Patrick Kelly for a stellar opening stint once again, cleaning up uh, as he has been known to do in that category. Fuel and tires for the prototype, and away it goes. And also, just a note, it looks a lot closer for that number four stop because they have a black banner on the outside of their wall. I would say from the picture that we saw retweeted on Twitter that you can see on your account, John, it's pretty standard that that's about how close the GTLM teams pull to the wall, but it looks much different between a Porsche white banner and a Corvette black banner. Certainly seem to have a little bit of a problem getting the uh, uh, getting the wheel off uh, that car. Thank you, Shea, for that VP Racing Fuel update. Uh, as Ricky Taylor has gone through and Harry Tinknell is closing in again. He's got it down to under seven tenths of a second down into turn one. And the clouds are beginning to gather. It's starting to bubble up just a little bit. Large body of water, of course, uh, close to the racetrack. It's not called Elkhart Lake for no reason at all. And that can have an effect on someone who lives near it to uh, a relatively large lake and a river running through it. So it can have a, an effect on weather patterns. An hour and 40 minutes still to go. So we've had a full hour of racing. And at the moment in GT Daytona, Townsend Bell leads from his teammate by about a second. It's Jack Hawksworth now in the 14 car as he chases the number 12 from Ian Vassar Sullivan. Then it's just under five seconds back to Bill Orbelin, who isn't gaining, certainly not the last time around. He was a few tenths slower than the two Lexus ahead of him in his BMW M6 from Turner Motorsports. The 96 running in the white, red and blue liquid molly colours. Lawson Aschenbach in fourth position for Mercedes. The Riley Motorsports car, the number 74, it is another three seconds further back and then 12 seconds away in fifth position. Paul Holton for Compass Racing's McLaren. Then the first of the Acuras. That's uh, Magic... Um, Magic Mario? No, it's not. Super Mario far back, excuse me, for MSR. And he's another second, call it two seconds further back and about a second away from his teammate, Alvaro Parent. Uh, is behind the wheel of the number 57 car. Eighth is Tony Villander for Scuderia Corsa, the WeatherTech Ferrari, another 2.7 seconds uh, further back down the road. Pat Long for Wright Motorsports now, the 16. That's the teal blue a fronted car. He's 16 seconds further back, and Mark Miller makes up the top 10. He's taken over from Till Bechtelsheimer in the Acura from Gradient Racing, the number 22, is eight seconds further back. Two Mazdas closing in in second and third as Harry Tinkles dropped back about a second from the leader. Give you the run down there in just a moment. First GT Le Mans, Earl Bamba for Porsche leads now by 11 seconds over Antonio Garcia. 9-1-2 from the number three Corvette. That's the yellow car. BMW of Conor de Filippi had an odd electrical problem uh, earlier on in the weekend. Uh, and then went long at turn five. Not the first person to do that this weekend, either, was he? 25, though, in at third position is about four, four and a half seconds uh, behind second place. Then it's Nick Tandy in fourth position in GTLM for Porsche. John Edwards for BMW is in fifth. And Tom Milner, after that early stop that took a little bit longer in the number four Corvette, is in sixth position in LMP2, Simon Trummer has taken over the PR1 Matheson Motorsport, Orica, the number 52 white and navy blue car that was driven so brilliantly well at the start by Patrick Kelly. Uh, and he's got a substantial cushion, 43 seconds. I said it was substantial. That's not a cushion, is it? It's like a three-piece swing. Ben Hanley in second place for Dragon Speed. James French just coming out of the pits for Performance Tech in third, but a little way further back. And at the front, Acura Team Penske still leading by 2.8 seconds over Harry Tinknell in the 55 Mazda. He's got half a second and Tristan Nunes, best of the Cadillacs, is nine and a half seconds further back. It is the number 10, Wayne Taylor Racing, Conic a Minolta sponsored car. He's got about four seconds on fifth place, Philippe Nasser in the red and white wheel in engineering. He's ahead of the Mustang sampling the dark grey number five by 
uh, about uh, three seconds uh, further back down uh, the road from that. If you're wondering where the other Acura team, Penske, uh, Dame Cameron, uh, made a mistake at turn five, cut back across the track, came into contact with Harry Tinknell, caused some damage, then got a puncture, then had a drive through and has dropped back and is now off the lead lap. That's how it stands and the battles continue, Jeremy Shaw, all the way through the field, including Nick Tandy and John Edwards, side by side, running down to turn five. Yeah, these are a long way behind the leaders, so GTLM has really spread out. Earl Bamba has got uh, a pretty good margin, over 11 seconds now over the Corvette of second place. We saw uh, Jordan Taylor slipping back towards the end of that first stint with uh, apparently tire wear issues. The Porsche running very, very well out front, though. Uh, for a few other points. First of all, the lake effect you were talking about, that's Lake Michigan, which is about uh, 15 miles to the east of us here. Uh, as we, we, we see from the onboards now, there's certainly some cloud around. There was, there was bright sunshine though just a few moments ago. So uh, dry conditions at the moment, but we'll certainly keep an eye on all of that. Other interesting uh, notes for me is that the LMP2 cars, we just saw them make their second pit stops of the day. The reason for that yeah, it's much shorter. They didn't need to stop yet in terms of either cars. As you see, the uh, Cadillacs, uh, this is a really tight battle. Tristan Nunez just going to lap down. Big battle for the leader, the top three leaders all absolutely together. But the LMP2 cars, John, they came and made their second pit stops earlier than scheduled because they wanted to get their uh, higher rated drivers out in the cars. Ben Hanley and Dragon Speed was the first to do that, taken over from Henry Hedman. And remember at Sebring, they did it too soon because they got disqualified from the race or put to the back end of the race, which is the leader of the pit lane. But uh, uh, PR1 team followed suit immediately afterwards to get Simon Trummer at the wheel number 52. Pit stops, John. Uh, yeah, Cher Adam, the first and second place cars coming in, and Harry Tinknell really closing in on the back of Ricky Taylor as they came to the pit lane speed limit. That was a great entrance for Tinknell. It really was, and I was talking to a driver earlier in the week about this very instance when you come into the pit lane of Road America and there's a car right in front of you. Is it even more aggravating because there's so much room to potentially go around? And he said, you have no idea. It's like walking behind a grandma. So we've got uh, into the pit lane and the number seven, it is Elio Castroneves taking over for Ricky Taylor as just waiting on the fuel. The tire stop was executed to perfection for the Mazda. It will also be fuel and tires, but I would expect this time Jonathan Bomarito to be taking over that car as away goes the number seven is the 55 already rolling though this is where the battle is out on the pit lane nope waiting for the pit board to come up waiting to be told to go is the 55 now it's told to go and once again it is behind the Penske so the pits advantage slightly to Acura team Penske yeah it comes in uh, with basically the Acura right on its tailpipes goes out with maybe half a second or a bit more when they get back up to speed. Uh, the Just for the sake of looking, that's a, a, a pretty standard looking stint for both of those. 18 laps for Ricky Taylor uh, on both of his early stints. Uh, so that's a, another, potentially another 36 uh, laps uh, out of another two stints. I reckon we've got somewhere near 48, 49 laps if we could stay green to the end of the race. Uh, Shea Adam, just before we leave you, hang on a second, uh, just uh, catching up on a little bit of action down towards uh, Canada Corner, where the 55 was right up the tailpipes uh, coming into the pit lane. I, I think that was still Harry Tinknell that was uh, behind the wheel of the 55 that didn't in fact change to J-Bomb. It was most certainly a reddish helmet, so that would be Harry Ticknell, Jonathan Bomarito with white and blue helmet. So they're doing the uh, inverse, what they did last year to win this race, where Jonathan started and drove the first two stints, and then Harry got in and drove the last two stints. This time, Harry's driving the first three and saving the end for Jonathan. The sister Mazda, though, the number 77, is into the pit lane fuel tires, and this time, Ollie Jarvis puts his helmet on to actually go out and drive a race car as Tristan Nunez is getting out. They're having to do the driver changes themselves amongst the team because they're not allowed that extra person into the track to then be allowed over the wall to do up the belts. So 
It was a good effort from Tristan Nunez to assist Ollie back into getting strapped into the car and a perfect timing stop in that they lost no time. The field probe come out, came out and the car went rolling. Also into the pit lane is the number five. That is Joao Barbosa. Just hang on a second, shit. And I would Just hang on a second because he's got out in front of the Acura. The Acura is in traffic and he's still got the Harry Tinknell 55 right up his tailpipes. It is the uh, number seven now driven by... Elio Castro Neves and they're trying to get around Bill Oberlin in the 96. Bill Oberlin uh, will race anything, it doesn't matter what class he's in. Uh, coming out of turn three, they've now caught the rejoining Ollie Jarvis under the Sargento Bridge and this is an opportunity for Harry Tinknell to use his teammate as a bit of a pick, using him as they go down. Oh, and the fantastic manoeuvre by Castro Neves who threads the eye of a needle going down into the braking area at turn five somehow looked like he was stuck in behind Ollie Jarvis but somehow found the space manoeuvred, manufactured the space to get between Jarvis and Tinknell and goes back ahead of both of the Mazdas that was superb opportunistic driving from Elio Castro Neves. We said in our Porsche keys to the race in the Michelin countdown to green, there's a time for patience here, but there's a time to take your chances and be decisive. And Elio Castro Neves, Jeremy Shaw, did just that at just the right time. And effectively, that will give him back the lead when Briscoe and Nasa make their stops in this rotation. Magnificent stuff from Castro Neves. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? That was absolutely tremendous racing there amongst those three prototypes and there'll be now a little bit of a hiatus and take a bit of a breather I think for a little while but boy what a move that was by Kastronovic he was he was fast on the straights but he was so late on the brakes as well I think he took uh, I took the Mazdas by surprise there but uh, great racing uh, the uh, two Cadillacs number 10 number 31 once again do one lap more than everybody else they too now uh, of uh, just making or made at their pit stops yes correct uh, it was uh, 19 and 90, uh, 19 and no, 19 and 80 for Briscoe. There should have been an extra lap away. Uh, they came in one lap after the uh, the Acuras, but they'd already done one better lap on the previous stint, hadn't they? So they should have been two laps better this time around. So they're not taking too many chances. Uh, Castro Neves then from Tinknell. That's the lead. Oli Jarvis, Briscoe stayed behind the wheel of the number 10 after full service. Pete Durrani is now behind the wheel of the number 31 wheel and Cadillac. But the leaders, Tinknell and Castro Neves, are at it. They are absolutely turned up to the max. This is worth the price of admission on its own, ladies and gentlemen. If you're trackside, this is the battle to watch. The Tangerine and White Acura from Penske. We now know that there'll be no extension to the Penske running of the Acura DPIs into next season. But Acura have made it, I think, pretty clear that other teams who might be interested in running them as privateer cars form an orderly queue at HPD in Santa Clarita. Second place for the Mazda, Oli Jarvis in third place for the other car. Magnificent move. I didn't think there was enough room there. And clearly Tinknell didn't think there was enough room either, Jeremy, because he thought, I've got to be, I've been clever. I've used, uh, I've used my teammate as a bit of a screen there in basketball terms. Yeah, I mean, uh, he really took Oliver Jarvis by surprise, didn't he? And uh, actually dive bombed in there, but it's a great move by, uh, by both of them. Uh, and uh, gosh, he's late on the brakes. He gets the car across in front of the nose of the number 77 car. And uh, wow, uh, that enables number 55 to go around the outside of him. That was a tremendous race. Let's have a look at it again. There's not actually, on, there's not actually an Acura's length there, is there? He has to go diagonally because well, there wasn't that, room. That was all on the brakes, wasn't it? Yeah. I and mean, he just braked later, way later than the, the you know, number uh, 77 car of Jarvis. Uh, and he, uh, yeah, that's really a surprise. Really a surprise, but great move, forceful move, but perfectly clean moves and executed oh, yes. absolutely magnificently by Elio Castro Neves. We've seen down through the years though, haven't we, how good Elio has been. I mean, he, he had a, a lap of temperature and pressure, but we've seen how good Elio has been in his single seat the days when he come out the pits. No tyre warmers here. And those outlaps are super important. And he's been the guy who can hustle a car. He doesn't mind if it's moving around. He's been very impressive on the brakes, on cold tyres in IndyCar as well.
well and he just used that to good effect there a bit bigger and heavier car but clearly a lot more downforce uh, as well and he was able to use that to his advantage the Daytona 24 the Rolex Daytona 24 didn't go exactly how he wanted but that was just I think that was just confidence oh hang on what's happened here uh, no, that's the two Mazdas. I just saw the white car behind Harry there. Uh, I mean, that, that was just confidence in the car and in his own ability there, Jeremy. And he's cleared off now. Yeah, that was very impressive, wasn't it? I mean, the, clearly that number seven car is, is on rails this weekend. They've absolutely uh, nailed the setup on that car. They've got uh, everything they need. They've got good straight line speed. They seem to have uh, good tyre wear uh, and they're looking good. The Cadillacs are going uh, a little bit further on their fuel, which is interesting. Um, but uh, they don't have the pace of the turbo cars uh, in the race, at least at this stage in the game. In LMP2, by the way, uh, I talked about uh, Ben Handy, I think, setting a new fastest lap of the race in the number 81 car for Dragon Speed in second position. But Simon Trommer has responded, retaken that fastest lap at 154.0 for Simon Trommer in number 52 car. Uh, and Han he now uh, leads that class by about over 40 seconds from Ben Hanley. James French, a distant third now for Performance Set Motorsports, and Carl Tilly, he's about 10 seconds behind James French in the fourth position. Nick Tanney looking at the back of John Edwards' BMW as they go out of turn five and through turn six. I'll keep an eye on that. Just some quick calculations, very unofficially at the moment. Um, if we keep on this pace, I reckon we've probably got 43, 42, maybe as many as 44 laps still to go, which means that, that that is not just a standard set of pit stops. The guys at the front of the field are getting 18 laps, maybe 19 laps out of a tank of fuel. Uh, and they, they all stopped a couple or three laps ago. That, that doesn't easily split up into stints Jeremy we might need a splash at the end unless there's a bit of fuel saving or of course a full course yellow of the safety car intervenes or the rain comes yeah they'll that, that, need two more pit stops is that what you're saying they'll need two more pit stops uh, yeah, they'll definitely need, I, I, they'll I don't definitely think they need can do it on two more pit stops I, I, I think um, that is not going to take them close enough they're, they're not doing 20 laps on a stint and there's, there's well over 40 laps to go uh, so what have we got? Uh, the, the leader stopped uh, at the end of lap 34, going on to 35. As into the pit lane comes the number six guy. They are off kilter at the moment, uh, and we're on 30. Oh, it's going to be it's going to be tight. It's going to be tight to do it on two more pit stops if they're going continue to do the the lappery that they're doing uh, at the moment. I, I think they might need a, a splash at the end if they go green all the way. That's what I'm seeing. Curious. I, I, yes, right. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly keep an eye on that one. That's going to be uh, very, very interesting to see uh, how that changes. The Cadillacs, uh, I would have thought, could be could do it, but we, we, we shall see. 38 laps down there. The, the gap between the two leaders isn't very much, and there is JPM ready to uh, take another stint in Off the number six car. And that car already, as you say, a lap down after that problem for Dane Cameron earlier, plus the drive-through penalty. New fastest Simon lap. Simon has just reset uh, fastest lap in LMP2, by the way. Yes, I was just about to say that as well. I saw the, the purple flash up on the screen. 153.492. I should say, by the way, the fastest DPI lap is credited to the car in which... Juan Montoya is now installed at 151.034. We haven't talked about uh, quick laps, Jeremy. It's the leaders are uh, together again, and I'll keep an eye on that. But we, uh, how are the lap times looking as opposed to race lap records, etc.? Well, yeah, the, the, that 51.034 uh, for uh, Dane Cameron, actually, I think it was, to set that lap just before he handed over the car. That is a new lap record. The old record for Oliver Jarvis, 151.133. So uh, that is a new fastest lap uh, record for Juan Pablo Montoya in the uh, DPI category. GTLM, the fastest lap so far, 202.6. Uh, that is a lap record also. The old lap record was Nick Tandy last year at a 202.7. The 2.6 now by Earl Bamba, but Ashton Lawrence Mantle set that time in the 
position number 9912 Porsche has now got a handy lead of over 14 seconds over the Corvette in second place. I love this battle at the front of the field. The two Japanese manufacturers in the IMSA series battling it out at the front of the field, Acura and Mazda. It looks to me as though Harry is a little bit, and the, and the Mazda is a little bit quicker through the twisty stuffs, and I say that, of course, and Harry just messes up going into turn five, where Elio is very, very strong indeed on the brakes. I don't think you're going to, we've seen already, I don't think you're going to outbreak Elio Castro Nevers into turn five, Harry. Uh, but it, it, it does seem as though in the, the portion from, let's say, turn six to Canada Corner, they do quite well, but coming up the hill and across the start-finish line, the Acura does seem to have a little more grunt. Now, the Mazda is only a, a four-cylinder two-litre, but it's turbocharged. It puts out a healthy power output. So I'm not sure if they both had a clear track, who'd be doing the better lap times uh, at the moment. Well, we saw the Acura's first and second in qualifying, so I suppose that answers that question, certainly as far as yesterday was concerned, but today is another day. Simon Trummer, having just re reset the lap records, then in LMP2, has... He's just heading down to turn number eight at the moment in that uh, very attractive Orica. The navy blue and white stroke silver. Still got this battle going on between the John Edwards BMW, the dark coloured BMW number 24, with Nick Tandy not happy at all to be in fifth position. He throws it up the inside into the final corner, but there's not quite a Porsche's width there. He got out the power nice and early, though, and he'd be right under the rear wing of the rear Hall Letterman Lanigan BMW as they climb the hill. Meantime, the battle for the lead goes past Patrick Long in the Wright Motorsports Porsche GT Daytona on the other side of the circuit, heading down the middle straight towards turn number five. And it looks to me as if Ollie Jarvis is just a wee bit closer to that battle now as they go through traffic and put another lap on Antonio Garcia, second in GT Le Mans for the bright yellow Corvette racing. Number three car under the Corvette bridge for the leaders overall into that turn six, that blind left-hander. Throw it at turn seven and just hold on for your life. Take all the concrete on the inside, right-hand side of that corner. Down through the gearbox for Harry. Looking at the white and tangerine rear end of the Acura in front of him. Just balancing the throttle so carefully. And then hard on the gas, long before you see the exit of that corner. You'd be waiting for another second or so in a GT car, but with the downforce available to the... DPIs, he was on the throttle, what, not even three quarters of the way around the, the carousel. That's extraordinary how quick he's picking up the throttle there. And these DPIs, Jeremy, we mentioned it in uh, the qualifying show and we talked about it at Sebring a few weeks ago. But these DPIs now putting in lap times that aren't so far away in real terms than the hundreds of millions of euros that were being spent by uh, Audi and the other big manufacturers in the P1 days as Nick Tandy's picked up a bit of advertising on the 911 decided he didn't want that wrapped on the front of his car a uh, little bit of uh, quick stop so that means he's run wide somewhere to manage to pick that up meantime back at turn one and back at the front of the race and Tony Vlander has the leaders going past his uh, Scuderia, Corsa, Ferrari. Yeah, Jeremy, just going back to those lap times. Yeah, all right, a couple of seconds or so away from the Audi R10 times that had a 1,000 horsepower and a bazillion uh, foot-pounds of, uh, of torque and about two tonnes of downforce uh, on a car that even the most expensive programmes are probably running for 13... 14 million dollars a year i mean it's extraordinary how much these dpis have come on these are proper racing cars no ifs no buts no maybes yeah it's great i i think your know, value for money of this dpi formula is really really good uh and and yeah um, um, i think unfortunately the global pa pandemic might have put paid to for at least for a little while for other manufacturers coming in but uh, other than that i think there's certainly a lot of interest in this whole formula i think it's absolutely tremendous you're right the race race lap record around here was set by Marco Werner uh, a dozen years ago 2008 he turned a 148.7 
in the R10 TDI Audi. The fastest lap, as we say today, 451.0. So just over a couple of seconds. Uh, and uh, and what did we do in qualifying, Jeremy? What was the qualifying uh, yesterday? Uh, 140. Uh, yesterday was a 149.0, which actually wasn't. The lap record was set last year by Dane Cameron, 148.7. Uh, Lucas Lua, it was, who set the track record in qualifying, 146. Point nine, also back in 2008. Back in those days, of course, you could turn the boost up for qualifying, which you can't do on these cars. They run with lower fuel and obviously fresh tyres. So it's not an exact comparison, but as you say, a couple of three seconds uh, between them when you consider the investment that's going into it and the fact that these cars can be run as customer privateer cars. Uh, and, and that, I think, is the key to the success going forward, uh, whether... DPI 2.0, LMDH, call it what you will, uh, is introduced on time by IMSA or not, and we expect some news on that uh, relatively shortly, certainly sometime before the end of the season. Uh, these cars, which, remember, are using a proprietary LMP2 chassis, so any of the four chassis manufacturers in LMP2, uh, in Gen 1 LMP2, that's what the... Uh, the DPI cars are. They've had the advantage of a little more development of the aero. Uh, the suspension pickups and units are uh, not the spec units. And of course, the engine and transmissions aren't the spec Gibson uh, units either. But ultimately, the carbon fiber backbone and centre section of these cars are LMP2s, the ACO LMP2 cars. Into the pit lane, Shea Adam, the number three Corvette, is back in again with an hour and 15 to go. And again, another issue with the pit stop and trying to tighten up the left front wheel. There was an issue with the gun. They're now using the gun from the rear to try and change the right front tire. As the fuel probe has been out for quite some time, the pit stop has been done. The car now drops off the air jacks, but there was another issue for the number three Corvette under that pit stop, which once again was determined more by the tires wearing off than a, necess a necessity for more fuel. Tony Garcia got slightly better life out of a brand new set of tires than Jordan Taylor did with the tires he had on at the start. 20 laps for Jordan, 22 for Tony Garcia, but considering their teammates got 26 and Fred Makovecki at the start of the race got 28 laps out of the Porsche before he peeled off into the pit lane. That is a big deficit. Uh, and extra pit stops for them before the end of the race. I, I look well, away to the, go ahead, Jeremy. No, I was just. I think the, the Corvettes. They've realised. I think they, they can. They, they have to make three pit stops during the race. So they're kind of equalising their stints. I think would be the way I was looking at. That's that's why okay. I think the number three car is coming. I presume that's the why the number three car is coming in uh, so much earlier than the rest of the field. Yeah, that would work out, Jeremy. Uh, I reckon there's uh, well under 40 laps to go now. So if they get 20 laps out of this set of tyres, which they should be able to do, then they'll have somewhere under 20 laps to go. Leader trading a tiny bit of paint with Bill Oberlin. Well, you can't put that one on Oberlin. He's right on the inside. And the number seven, Elio Castro Nevis, going round the outside, just squeezed down on him a little bit, gets a little sideways movement. But Elio being Elio just keeps his foot in on the exit of the carousel. Temperature beginning to drop just a little bit in the air. 24 Celsius track temperature has dropped down to 32. For those of you listening on 87.7, that's at 90 degrees Fahrenheit on track. Now, remember, that was in well into triple digits at the start of the race. So the sun going behind the clouds, track temperature has dropped. Air temperature still around about the mid 70s, 75 Fahrenheit at the moment. Top three together, Jeremy, exiting Canada corner. We love this type of racing. We do, don't we? It's a tremendous race. Uh, it has been for the last, uh, well, since this last round of pit stops, there's been nothing to separate these three leaders. I think Elio Castroneves, I just get the impression he's just driving a little bit conservatively. I think uh, Ricky Taylor was doing the same in the opening stint as well, just giving a little bit of extra margin, if he possibly can, not perhaps to the other prototypes, because as we saw when he was weaving his way through the masses right after that pit stop, it, he, he, he was aggressive there when he needed to be. Otherwise, I think he's, he's being just a little bit cautious, you know, driving at sort of kind of 95% rather than 100%, and I think that uh, could pay off in the long run. The masses, though, I mean, they're not far behind, are they? They're literally and figuratively. Yeah. Renga van der Sander in behind the wheel of the number 10, Conning and Minolta Cadillac DPI in 
uh, what, fifth position. Let's check that fourth position, excuse me, because we have lost one of the accuracies at the sharp end of the field. He is only 13 and a half seconds away from the leaders and better off on fuel by uh, a couple of laps uh, on the leading pair and a lap on Ollie Jarvis. And those Cadillacs have been going, for the most part, a lap longer. And that, if we are going to be tight at the end, could make a huge difference. It's not about not having enough in total to get round, as we were talking about in our Porsche keys to the race in the Michelin countdown to green. Four miles around here, if you're out, you're out, and you're not going to cruise to the line. But what it does mean, and we've seen in some of the Challenge Series races this weekend already, that you are so tight on fuel that basically you might have to trim four, five, six seconds off your lap time to get anywhere near getting to the end. And at that point, if somebody's still going full rich, then even a 13-second lead is going to disappear very, very quickly indeed in the last couple of three laps. So this one's not going to be over until it's over. I can't wait to see when the next pit stops are. The teams, Jeremy, will be back timing or at least uh, back calculating. They'll be looking at all the data that we've got. We've been full green ever since the start. Hashtag blame Hindoff if anything happens now. I know, I'll take it. But th they will be gathering data all the time. They will know now from the couple of fills that they've had how much exactly has gone into the car and what the fuel burn rate is. So they are in a better position now than they were at the beginning of the race to do those calculations. Yeah, uh, I'm, to, my, to my mind, there's no doubt they can make it on, on four pit stops. Just looking, the number 81 car, which is a second place car in uh, LMP2, that has just been onto the pit lane for its, what, third stop of the day. Uh, and I think from here, with a bit of a stretch, that uh, Ben Hanley should be able to get to the finish with just one more pit stop. Oh, okay. Uh, and the, the LMP2 cars could do some pretty similar mileage to the DPIs. The. Um, the deficit to Simon Trummer was about 40 seconds before this place is pitched off from number 81. Car number 38 and the 18 uh, are third, fourth, quite a long way behind. Actually, Carl Tilly is been closing on James French, uh, number 18 car for Euro Motorsports. The Carl Tilly is only about five seconds now behind James French in the battle for the podium in LMP2. Well, this battle for the lead is enthralling. I know we're talking about it a lot. Um, we're keeping an eye on what's going on uh, elsewhere. And in fact, Bill Oberlin has uh, closed up just a little bit and he's on the back of Jack Hawksworth now and the two Lexus. So first, second and third in GT Daytona has closed up a wee bit. And Oblum within a second of Jack Hawksworth, who's within a couple of, call it three seconds, of his teammate. That's the top three in GTD. Earl Bamba's got 17 seconds on Conor De Filippi, who has got 18 seconds, is that right? Yeah, on uh, John Edwards. Uh, in third position. And then Tandy's nine seconds further back. So GT Le Mans fractured for a change. LMP2, Simon Trummer has reap the benefit of a great opening stint and a half from Patrick Kelly and has over a minute, nearly 80 seconds in fact, and at the front it's half a second, it's barely measurable now, top three cars within a second, Castro Neves for Acura number seven, Tinknell for the dark red 55 Mazda Motorsports prototype and then Ollie Jarvis' his teammate in the white car, they are absolutely together and some uh, yeah. 13 seconds ahead of what is beginning to be a bit of a battle, Jeremy, for fourth position between Finder Zander and Durrani. Yeah, that has heated up again, hasn't it? Interesting to me, the pace of Elio Castroneves at the lead, in the lead of the race. The, the previous stint for number seven car, Ricky Taylor was doing kind of 51s, one minute 51s when he had clear traffic. Uh, the best lap that Elio has done, I think it's been the last time 52, around, 52 four. eight. Yeah. Uh, OK, it might have done one quicker than that. Uh, 52 fours, yeah, yeah, that's right, on lap 39, you're right. Uh, but uh, other than that, he's been in, in the, uh, the, the 53s and fours and even fives. So I think that just shows either something isn't quite right or they're trying to save fuel or he's just being ultra-conservative. Ricky pick, Taylor's best... Pick, pick, pick your choice. Yeah, well, R uh, Ricky, in the first stint, his best lap was a 51.5 and his average was about a 53.5. 51-3, as you said, in the second stint, and his average was about a 53-3, so he did pick up his, his pace just a wee bit. 
Elior, a 52-4 is his best, as you've mentioned. So, yeah, it has just eased the pace a little bit. But as you say, the question is, what's behind that? Something or, or nothing? And he's, he's not done a full stint yet. Yeah, his average is he's still under a 54. He's, he's averaging about a 53-8 at the moment. But he's under extreme pressure from these two guys and having to pick his way through traffic. The two, the Mazda twins at the moment, have just dropped away for a moment, but still only a second between the top three. You don't, if, you, if you're at Mazda, you don't want to see Ollie Jarvis and Harry Tinknell fighting as Tonio Garcia puts in from sixth position in GT Le Mans, the fastest lap of the GT Le Mans race so far. That's a 2.02.664. I think that's another race lap record, isn't it, Jeremy? Uh, yes, it absolutely is. It was Nick Tandy last year, 2.02.7. Uh, so he has, uh, Garcia has just nipped that away from... Uh, it was Lawrence Vantor, wasn't it, earlier on, who had the, uh, the fastest lap. So, uh, again, uh, the Corvettes, certainly on fresh tyres, are really, really quick. What they don't seem to be able to do is have the, uh, the longevity on no. those tyres, which is really unusual. But then Shay talked about the fact she thought maybe that the uh, Corvette started uh, on the soft, uh, qualified on the softer tyre. Correct. Uh, whereas the, the other guys were on the harder tyres. That that's probably the explanation for that. We'll have to see. Meantime. We, they, they, don't, they don't normally share that information, do they? No. Meantime, Bill Oberlin is right with Jack Hawksworth, who's lost ground to his teammate, and he's going to lose second place as well as they almost go three wide with two BMWs mugging the Lexus in second place. The other BMW is the M8 GTLM, the number 25 car of Conor De Filippi. But Bill Orbelin has hunted down and now has passed the first of two Lexus. But that gap, which was virtually nothing at all, not so very long ago between Townsend Bell and Jack Hawksworth, has gone out to over five seconds. So it's as much Hawks with losing pace as it is Bill Oberlin picking his pace up. 5.3 seconds, write that down somewhere, but write it in pencil because you're going to be rubbing it out, I think, as Bill Oberlin sets off in hot pursuit of Townsend Bell. Up into second and still in pursuit of that record-breaking IMSA victory that would take him to the top of the list on his own. Jeremy Shaw. Yeah, and it's interesting to me that, uh, that, that, that uh, if you're right, it's Hawks with slipping back rather than... Uh rather than um, uh, get closing in uh, because uh, the, the, the gap between them was, was, had been fairly stable for quite a while. It's the gap from first to second has extended quite a bit over the last few laps. So Townsend Bell really doing a nice job there in the number 12 car. And uh, in the, the most recent race at Sebring, it was the number f uh, 12 car that qualified on pole position ahead of the 14. Uh, and uh, the positions were reversed in the race this weekend. It was the number 14 car that started ahead of number 12. Once again, at this stage, at least, with uh, an hour to go, hour and three minutes to go, and then once again, the position between those two Lexuses this is, has been reversed. A couple of laps before we see the leaders into the pit lane for what will be their penultimate stop, coming down to an hour to go. And... Watching the Mazdas keep the action was honest is, is effectively what I was going to say there, Jeremy. We'd seen the qualifying pace of the Acuras and wondered if they would drive off into the distance. Mazda were being a little bit coy about their potential performance here, but they and in, in fact comes Castro Neves, right? Okay, well, that is a, a lap, I think that's possibly a lap earlier. Uh, than I thought it might have been. He's followed in this time. Now, this is interesting. He's followed in by Ollie Jarvis, who was the one who stopped last out of the leading trio last time around. So this is a bit of a change around for Mazda. I wonder if they're playing the team game here and uh, trying to get Harry Tinknell with a clear lap. Maybe he feels he's got the car underneath him to be able to jump the seven in the pit stops. In comes the Mazda as well. Jeremy? I'm sure you're right, because the uh, the, 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 the pace for Castronovas hadn't been stellar, it been fine, enough to keep ahead of the man, but now by staying out on the same set of hot set of tyres, with Harry, Harry Tinkle can have a clean run now, and, and have, a of, uh, have a good in-lap, should be in good shape. And, of course, they won't have to put quite as much fuel in the 77, so they might even get track position in the pits. No, they haven't managed to do that, but they're going to follow them out pretty closely. 
Now, we'll wait to see when Tinknell comes into the pit lane. No headlights on the 77, which I'm rather surprised at as it comes out of the pit lane. Just fuel and tyres for both, she tells us from the VP Racing Fuels pit report. In from the lead of LMP2 comes Simon Trummer. And he... Well, that is... Yep, yeah, that's about right. This is the 20-lap yeah. stint. Now, if assuming that we are going to go green through to the end, we are still looking at something around about, or possibly even over 30 laps to go yet. So, as Jeremy said, there will be another pit stop uh, after this one. The question is, it's not going to be a full load of fuel required. In comes Tinknell, and Tinknell was held up just a little bit in the last third of the lap, and that, Jeremy, might be crucial, as in comes the 55 as they're heading to do the balancing pit stop to what we've just seen from the two leaders, and Shea Adam is watching the sole red crystal Mazda come to its pit stall. This might be a driver change as Jonathan Balmerito waits Point. to get into the 50 for the first time in this race. Uh, we have seen helmeted second drivers for every single pit stop that the Mazdas have done with the co-drivers replacing water bottles. So once again, Jonathan up on the wall. This time he runs around to the left side of the car, though, indicating that, yes, he is going to be doing some driving. So Harry Tinkle finally gets out of that 55 miles. So there's fuel and tires going on for that car in terms of their service. Also further back in the pit lane, I spotted James French for performance tech into the pit lane. Fuel and tires for that LMP2 car as well. But just waiting on the fuel and for the driver's side door to go back down as the driver change. Still taking just a little bit too long. Now they get a hit from Axel's fuel left side of the car to indicate, all right, Harry, your time is up. We've got to go. The fuel probe is out and away goes the 55. I hope all the belts were done up for Jonathan. Yeah, it looked like they were struggling just a little bit, Shea, to get Jonathan Bomarito uh, plugged in and out uh, behind uh, one of the LMP2 cars as well, which jumped up in the pit lane. That means it wasn't a clear exit uh, for J Bomb, and he's now going to be overtaken as well by the Dragon Speed. Number 81 cars, Ben Hanley, goes through, but the two leaders are long gone, Jeremy. So that didn't work for them. Staying out one lap longer for the 55 this time didn't work, and in fact, they're going to have to keep uh, their eyes peeled because I think I saw a Cadillac looming up behind them in the shape uh, of the number five of Sebastian Bourdais uh, heading up behind them. Yes, it was. Uh, and they're right there at turn six. So that hasn't worked for the 55 car this time around. It hasn't. Uh, and number five car, that has yet to make its, its third pit stop of the day. So uh, that car will be preening in probably another lap or so. The other two Cadillacs also uh, are still running out front. Uh, I would expect them in uh, this or that. Oh, it's interesting. Number 10 car stayed out yeah. on this lap. Number 31 car has come into the pit lane. Oh, really? Uh, that is for people. That is only a 16 lap stint. For people, but as you've yeah, said, they're going to have to make it really comfortable yeah. to make it from, from here. Make one more stop from here. Yes, yeah, yeah. there's, there's a wide window. Oh, you? down the inside. That's a great battle for the lead at Canada Corner, and for a moment they're side by side. They're still side by side, and Ollie Jarvis is now going to take the lead and does take the lead. He'd gone right the way around. The outside, that started a lot further back than when we picked it up down at Canada Corner. But that battle for the lead, outstanding. And Ollie Jarvis, who followed the leader in, remember, when he didn't need to, has now sneaked the lead away with just under an hour to go and still one pit stop, round about 15, 16 laps away for these two leaders. And that is the effective lead of the race. Renger van der Zander is actually scored in the lead, but he hasn't made his pit stop yet. But that's Oli Jarvis going through to the effective lead of the race in a very forceful move. Indeed, give credit to Elio Castro Neves. He didn't make it easy, Jeremy. He was right down the inside at Canada Corner, but the force was strong with Jarvis. That was a great move and uh, really, again, good respect for driving for all these guys. Nothing, no silly business going on there. Just like, good, clean, hard racing. Great pass there uh, by uh, by Oliver Jarvis. And that was uh, that was a bit of a surprise, wasn't it? Because uh, he was, the, the Mazda looks good on the straights, but the Mazda is handling, the, the Acura looks really good on the straights, but the Mazda is handling really, really nicely and a good forceful move at turn 13 to make sure that Jarvis came out ahead there. Uh, and then he got a good run off the final corner as well. So that was really, really interesting. The curious thing 
as to why the number 55 car lost so much ground during that pit stop sequence. You said he was, had a little bit of a traffic, but all of a sudden he's, he's lost nearly seven seconds yeah. towards these two. I think it must have been, that must have been some sort of a problem on the pit stop for the number 55 car. Look to, it looked like the they were... Lost, lost, Nope, still cruising around. I reckon he could could go another lap if they want to. This is only uh, his 18th lap for Renga van der Zander. That car has done uh, 19 lap stints previously, so there's at least one more uh, lap of fuel in the tank, depending on uh, how rich they've been running and how hard he's been pushing. Uh, Durrani, as I said, only did a 17 lap stint last time around. Uh, just a 16 lap stint for Ollie Jarvis when that car's been doing uh, 17, 18, 19 lap stints. So that was tactical there to try and keep him with the leader. And I think that's worked out better than leaving Harry Tinkle out in the 55. Now, the only thing I, I will say is it's two laps there. Let me do a quick bit of calculation. It, it might mean that Harry's last stop is a bit shorter because he'll need a bit less fuel or he can do his last stop a tiny bit earlier either either or um for that as the rain is beginning to fall at the circuit we have got rainfall the rain that we were expecting has now arrived with 55 and a half minutes to go and i wonder if that's one of the reasons they've left renga van der zander out and off has gone people to ronnie durrani's off Wheel and Engineering, 31 Cadillac is off. It's raining on that part of the circuit. Now, that might bring out a full course caution. I think if I was Renga van der Zander, I'd be in the pits right now. Yes, he has come into the pits. And people's got the car rolling. I think it's the outside of turn seven, is it? And, uh, yeah, it's pouring. It's pouring at the bottom of turn three. It's the bottom of turn three. We've got another car off there as well. And it's absolutely pouring down. It's the bottom of turn three. And Van der Zander will go on to wet weather tyres here on his standard pit stop. And this could be a stroke of genius. Remember what we said in our Porsche keys to the race, stretching that fuel window with weather and the tyres could just play into the strategic window of opportunity. It's got to be wet tyres here, Shea Adam, for this VP Racing Fuel Pit report. Yes, and also following in the Konica Minolta Cadillac was the 44 GRT Magnus Lamborghini that's been running down in the bottom part of the top 10 of GTD all race long. Wet weather tires going on to that 10 as we have stayed green. We should be seeing a flurry of pit stops. This is also into the pit lane is one of the Lexuses as that's Townsend Bell coming in first. Actually, no, we've got pretty much everyone into the pit lane. Now, remember, we do not have an intermediate, so it's either wet or dry. And right now, you're going to need those wet missiles. That has been played right into the hands of Wayne Taylor Racing. Uh, Ollie Jarvis has stayed out. Jarvis has stayed out. He's gone past the pits and stays out in awful conditions. The wiper is going. There's a huge amount of spray. Now, what I will say is hot, slick tyres still do give you some grip so long as there's no standing water. As Eve said, no intermediates, no cut slicks in IMSA competition. It's a slick or a wet weather treaded tyre. And Jarvis has pulled out a huge amount of gap uh, between himself and Elio Castro Neves. Off, the Lamborghini is off. Is that a Lamborghini? Uh, that has gone off on the far side of turn seven. It is it is the survival of the fittest at the moment. Uh, it's a big slide for a Porsche in the spray. That's not stopping. Down towards turn one. That's going off that uh, going off a very long way and it will hit the wall. And that's going to be a full course yellow. That's not coming out of there. That was the leader in GT Le Mans staying out on slicks. And Earl Bamba lost that uh, a roundabout halfway between the exit of the pits and the first corner, he was sideways for a very long way in the spray. I could just about pick out the headlights. And he's been joined by one of the MSR Acuras that's come in as well. And that's about Alvaro Parent who's gone in. And we've got a full course caution. Full course caution. This is going to be huge. Absolutely huge. Now, everybody will be allowed to come in and do their pit stops. This is... A, a bit of a shame, really, for Renga van der Zander, but uh, because they got the 
Cole Wright and other people haven't had the opportunity to pit, but they will be able to come in. Now, my question will be, will they get a lap on the field? They might no, get a lap on the field here. The, 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 the curious thing is Jarvis oh, stayed out. I, I, mean, I cannot understand that at all, Jeremy. No, that's... Uh, Bamba oh, yeah, lost that one. a mile back. A mile back. He hasn't done too much damage. He's just got no grip and he can't get out of the kidney litter. That is a very, very big gravel trap there. Alvaro Perens uh, did make contact in the MSR Acura and that car's gone around. Listen carefully to our effects mics and you can hear the rain falling at the moment. So, right, what's happened here? What's happened with Renga van der Zander? Ren Renga van der Zander is scored in second place at the moment. So Oli Jarvis must have gone back through to get back the lead of the race while van der Zander was in the pits. Okay. And, and John, with a full course caution coming out, he could not bring that number 77 car into the pit. He can't bring it in now. Been closed. Correct. Can't bring it in now. So van der Sand is going to get the lead of the race because he won't need to stop. He certainly won't need for tyres, but everybody behind him needs tyres. My timing screen was just taking a wee moment to catch up a little bit. I had a three minutes and eight second lead for van der Zander at one stage, which uh, I thought was uh, a little bit unlikely. Our AMR safety team. Oh, the leader in P2's been off as well. Well, that's extraordinary. Trummer's had an off as well. He still leads and Hanley two, in two, second. Two of, the, two of the four class leaders have been off, been off and had accidents. Uh, another one that hasn't... And he's gone off again. ...to make a pit lane. Trum has gone off again under the safety yeah. car at turn five. He just couldn't get the car turned in. Well, he's, uh, he's got damage to the left front. Damage yeah, to the left front. he's still on slicks. Because he had pitted just a, a couple of three laps before the rain came down, so he was on slick tyres. Well, the 81 car has been into the pits and has changed onto wets, as has a lap down, I think, the number 38 LMP2 car. Yeah, and I think Ben Hanley's dropped off the lead lap in LMP2 as well. If not, he must have been very had, close to he it. He had done. Yeah. But, uh, but but that's because he he came in to make a pit stop. Correct. To take on slicks, whereas number ah, two is... car stayed out and then couldn't come in because the pits were closed. Well, it is absolutely teeming down. We are back with the weather that has characterised 2020. If 2020 has been about a couple of things, obviously COVID, but in racing terms, it's been about bad weather. My first race of the season was at the Dubai 24 hours. It ran seven hours and 13 minutes because we had three and a half feet of water in the pit lane and round the circuit, I kid you not. Another banner picked up by the number 52 LMP2 leader, which is nice because it's kind of being used as a snow plow uh, to clear some of the water off the pits at the moment. Never has a WeatherTech banner been more appropriate from the side of the pit lane. This is nearly undrivable, even on slick, uh, even on wet weather tyres at the moment. The standing water has immediately collected around the track. We've seen races stopped for this kind of weather before. Monza a couple of three weeks ago for one of the Creventic races. It rained as hard as this, and within 15, 20 minutes, there was so much water underneath the old, where it goes underneath the old circuit, that the safety car couldn't actually get through it because it was too deep. Um, racing tracks do have drainage, but this amount of water falling this quickly. So as it stands at the moment, Oli Jarvis leads from Renga van der Zander in second, Mazda 77 from Cadillac number 10. The Cadillac is already on wet weather tyres. Key point to that. Then it's Castro Neves in the seven. Jonathan Bomarito in the 55. That's Acura and Mazda. Then it's Sebastian Bourdais. Uh, Pipo Durrani on his outlap. Pipo Durrani was on his outlap when he crashed the Cadillac. Uh, oh, no, he's got that car back, hasn't he? So he's been in and out. Now, did he enter a closed pit? What? Probably, but he, he, he was off. No, he hadn't. 18.54. That was four minutes ago when he left the pits. Yeah, that was... No, he, I, I think he went out on slicks, didn't he? That was before the rain came. Yes, he okay. was. That was before the rain came. So he was out on slicks, and I think, and then crashed. Uh, well, he came in after the full course yellow. Again, yes, OK. Yes, yeah. he did. That's right. Yeah. That's right, because he'd already been off at that stage. Right, OK. OK. And he, yeah. he has managed to keep stay on the Share Adam, what do you have? 
Nick Tandy is currently scored as the lead in GTLM. That just switched over. Connor D. Filippi, oh, he came into the pit lane. The pit lane should still be closed as they're circulating around behind the safety car, but I'll have to check the cameras to see the next the next time they go by. I do not believe that the pit closed lights have been signaled off yet. Uh, I would agree with that because I haven't seen the pit lane open note from race control on the race control screen, which would normally happen. Um, the six car was off at, on the front straight. That was Juan Montoya. So he's had another moment, uh, but he has continued according to race control. So apologies in all the excitement. Didn't uh, pick that one up for you. But the six Acura is still running in seventh position. But at the moment, until he comes round, I can't tell you if he's dropped off the lead lap. He may have. Yeah, there's damage to the back of that car. So thank you to our colleagues at NAS uh, the NASCAR Productions who confirmed that visually. So that's been a nasty off for uh, Juan Montoya as well, adding to the problems that that car had uh, earlier on. Well, cat pigeons amongst uh, rearrange in... Uh, into a well-known phrase or saying mother nature once again playing her part here so i have a i have a suspicion we'll be having a few penalties for entering a closed pit when we get to the end of this there's 45 minutes to go all of the strategies uh, are thrown up in the air now quite frankly but you've got to say that whatever happens from here when the pits are open van der sander will stay out and he will assume the lead of the race in the Cadillac, which we know is getting good fuel mileage. And uh, Van der Zander has uh, got the advantage of having wet weather tyres on. And he's only been out for a couple of laps. Now, quite a bit more shit, Adam, than uh, essential service needed. Uh, for the number six car, so they're going to take a penalty for working on that car in what we believe is a closed pit. Slick, uh, slick tyres coming off the number six car. Shit, Adam. Full wet tyres going on for Juan Pablo Montoya, but it does need a bit more remedial work than even that. The rear wing cluster is completely destroyed on that car, as also into the pit lane, a car that spun in pretty much the exact same spot on the exact same lap, the number 52 of Simon Trummer, making it back into the pit lane after ditching the WeatherTech banner. They're going to need a new nose on that car, too, at the very least, as water pours off the back bodywork as they take the engine cover off of the number six Acura. At this point, I can't see what they have to gain by sending that car back out. It will already be in the last position by the time the car is back around once more, That's fighting for point. every last oh, in the seventh hang position, on even though it's pretty much... Uh, yeah, if there's a big storm uh, just uh, over the top of the racetrack uh, at the moment, although it is moving to the south and there's not really anything uh, behind it heading off down towards Plymouth, uh, coming in from the Elkhart Lake area. But as I say, moving away at the moment. Now, still have not seen a pit open sign. Those of you at the track, hope you've got your weatherproofs. Who didn't bring a coat this weekend? Come on, put your hands up. Looks like down at the number six car, they might be worried about drive shaft or gearbox issues. Shea Adam, VP, Racing Fuels Pit Report. The work continues on the back of this car as yes, they have gone to work right in the middle of the back of the car, which is where the transmission and the gearbox tend to be housed. So perhaps it's actually something as simple as a suspension linkage to that right rear wheel. At least they would be hoping that it's a much easier fix, but it is going to be a bit longer for Juan Montoya sitting in the pit lane before he's cleared to leave. I think the good news, uh, Jeremy, is that this is, um, I, I won't say a passing shower, it is, is a passing weather feature, uh, according to the radar that we've just seen. Uh, and we have half a chance, I would say, in 43 minutes of, of getting some more racing going. Uh, but uh, as yet, no one's come into the pits from uh, the substantial body of the field. So that would suggest to me that the pits indeed have not yet been opened. And I'm still not seeing that message. I don't know if you're seeing anything different, Jeremy, but I am not seeing on the race control channel that the... Uh, pit lane has been opened. My last message is the 52, of course, uh, and continued. Uh, and that is the last message I have, and that was uh, some 10 yeah. minutes ago. 
Yeah, John, I mean, they, they, they haven't been able to yet to do the pass around. But we, Red we, flag. Uh, Red flag. Yeah, okay. Red it's, flag. It's just, it's just too wet. They haven't been able to do the pass around. But what I mean by that for, for, for non-regular listeners is the fact that cars that are trapped between the safety car and the class leader are able to go past the safety car and then run around to the back of the pack because otherwise uh, they would have been kind of just inconvenienced by the time in the yellow. So that's a, a, a great rule. I think it's brought in many years ago. But they haven't been able to do that yet because there's been so much uh, wet, you know, wet weather on the track and, and, and getting the field to actually pack up behind the, the, uh, the safety car. Well, time certain race, so the clock will tick on at the moment. Ollie Jarvis is the leader behind the Corvette C8 safety car. So the procedure will be as follows, that the safety car will bring the cars to a halt. People Durrani still with the damaged front end on the number 31. So I think he did... I think he did damage that on his way out of the on his outlap from the pits. Uh, that's extraordinary if that is the case, or maybe they've just changed the tyres on that car and done nothing else as emergency service, and they're hoping they'll get away with that. They are. They look like maybe they are still slick tyres on that. Uh, Cadillac number 31. Uh, so the procedure will be the safety car. Jeremy will bring that the field around. I would expect, because the, the pit lane is so wide here, that they will bring everybody into the pit lane and leave them in the acceleration lane of the pit lane. But it's effective park firm air, which means no work to be done on the cars uh, unless sanctioned by IMSA. So, yes, they'll probably come into the pit lane, but no, it's not an opportunity for, for people to service their cars. That's right. And uh, with, with the conditions as they are, it... It certainly isn't inconceivable. Ipsa might say, look, you can change the tyres. That won't happen yeah. initially, uh, right away. Uh, but that would be extremely good news uh, for a few of the teams out there, that's for sure. But bit, boy, what carnage bit, that was. That'll be a bit of a blow for Cadillac and Conning and Minolta. I, I, I had wondered if they would open the pits and let everybody do the pit stops before they threw the red flag, actually, just to let people who made the right tactical call actually get the advantage of it. So, do you know what? Down at the bottom end of the circuit, the rain is easing already. So, I, I like to be of a sunny disposition, um, literally, metaphorically, in any way as possible. There's still standing water on the track, but the best way to clear standing water from the track is to get 30 race cars on Michelin wet tyres that clear a bath water of, of uh, water, a bath full of water, every two tenths of a second from each wheel. So maybe we can get back out. Pit lane is still showing closed. So obviously they've been told to go in there. But just to confirm then, the pit's closed light was still on. So anybody who came in there will get a... Before being led in by the safety car to park firm here, will get a penalty once we go back to green. And that's going to be quite a lot of people. I could go back through, but I'm not going to. Because it would be like a bingo card. Uh, two crew members. Now, this is what I'm talking about. So on the uh, on the pit control channel, two crew members allowed at the car. Cars may be covered. Drivers can get out and a jump start battery permitted. So that's the sort of information that's been passed to the team so they know exactly what they can do uh, without taking any kind of uh, any kind of penalty. We're under red flag. Let's give you the running order as they came uh, in behind the pits, into the pits behind the safety for car here at the IMSA Road Racing Showcase at Road America with just under 40 minutes to go. We've uh, threw, threw the yellow flag uh, for bad weather and incidents on the track at uh, seven minutes before the hour. So that is now uh, some uh, 20 minutes ago already. Um, extraordinarily uh, sorry that uh, 10 minutes ago so it's Oli Jarvis for Mazda leading from Renga van der Zander on wet weather tyres for Cadillac of course if it dries out maybe he gets left on the wrong tyres for a bit and people don't change their tyres uh, the number seven Elio Castro Neves Acura uh, is in third place from Jonathan Bomarito in the 55 Mazda uh, in 
fourth in fifth all these cars on the lead lap and for the moment forget about any times on the timing screen that show the gaps between them because they will disappear when we restart behind the safety car uh, Bordier in fifth in the number five Mustang sampling then the wheel and engineering Durrani car but that is damaged that number 31 and is still damaged as it sits unable to be worked on uh, Montoya is off the lead lap in seventh position in the number six car, having had a couple of offs today and also having definitely entered a closed pit. There'll be other people uh, that will get the penalties for that when we go back to green. Vautier is in eighth position, also off the lead lap. In LMP2, uh, Simon Trummer had damage on the PR1 Matheson Motorsport car, and I reckon he entered a closed pit as well. Uh, and he is now on the same lap as Ben Hanley in second place for Dragon Speed. James French is one lap further back in third for Performance Tech. Nick Tandy is in 12th overall but leading GT Le Mans and he leads Connor De Filippi who's on the same lap in second place but Tommy Milner for Corvette in a number three car is a lap away from those two leaders uh, as is John Edwards in fourth place Tony Garcia in fifth place and Earl Bamba was in the gravel and what I don't know is whether that car has resumed yes it has because it's got into the pit so that car uh, is still, uh, as I say, a lap off the class lead, but has rejoined. Townsend Bell for Ian Vassar Sullivan leads from Jack Hawks within second. Lawson Ashenbach in third. So Bill Oberlin had got up into second there for Turner Motorsport. So what happened there? Because Bill Oberlin now down into fourth position. So did he have an off as well? Uh, Tony yeah. Vlander is fifth for Scuderia Corsa. Uh, sixth is Compass Racing, Paul Holton. Seventh, Wright Motorsports, Porsche, Pat Long. Eighth, Mershank Racing. And there are the top a top seven, Jeremy, and they're all on the lead lap. D did did Oberlin pit there or something go wrong for him? Because he had got a bit a second ahead of Jack Hawksworth, if you remember. He had uh, the, the, the Lexus pair stayed out one lap longer than number 96 had. number 96 and number 76 came in on one lap and then everybody else came in the uh, the following lap when the rain really started to come down um so i think it was probably just a factor of that to be honest uh getting think, this uh, going out Sorry, Jeremy, an important uh, note for those of you at the track. Can you take shelter now, please? If you're listening on 87.7 or the PA system, uh, the weather warning uh, is now to take shelter uh, at the circuit, please. Uh, and we believe that uh, Bill Oberlin pitted before the yellow flag. As I say, there's going to be a lot of working out to do because there were a lot of people who entered a closed pit. Hearing now as well that uh, the... Uh, damage to Montoya's car was was caused by being rear-ended on the front straight in the bad weather and the bad visibility by Simon Trummer in the 52 leading LMP2 car. That I've got to say that uh, by the damage we saw, that does make sense visually as well. And frankly, what was going on at the front straight in the worst of that, there was so much uh, spray in the air, I'm surprised anybody could see anything. But already it's clearing up down by Canada Corner. I can see people have started to take off their protective gear down there. Wave to the camera on your left, those of you in the Canada Corner bleachers. Look, look towards the next corner and wave to the camera. Well done. I can see you doing it. Gentleman in the back in black there. Very good. And uh, the, so that is looking a lot better. And it almost looks like it's starting to dry. There's still plenty of heat out there. Track temperature still 21 Celsius. Or if you uh, prefer, 70 Fahrenheit. I mean, that's lost a lot from what it was. Down to 33 minutes to go, Jeremy. But I'm, 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 I'm very optimistic we'll get this restarted. Yeah, let's hope so, certainly. The, the question was, was there a lightning strike uh, within, was it 20 miles of the, of the racetrack or 12, 12 to 20, something like that, whatever it is. Uh, if there's a lightning strike within a certain uh, area, then the, all the, the camera people have to, have to uh, take cover, fans obviously have to take cover, and everybody has to take cover. So if that's the case, I think there's a minimum 30-minute window before we're able to go back to green again. If there wasn't a lightning strike, if it just was that heavy rain and, and you know severe, uh, severe rain, then we might be able to get away without that mandatory uh, uh, delay. 
Fingers not, crossed. Nothing about lightning from race control at the moment, no. so we may not need that 30-minute pause. Uh, I've got the first of the closed pit uh, infractions. Uh, the gradient racing car, Mark Miller in the Acura, entered a closed pit. We know that the number six of... Uh, Acura, uh, Team Penske entered the close pit and the 52, we guessed that one as well. So those are the first three, 22, 6 and 52, all entered a closed pit. Uh, that was after the full course yellow was thrown at seven minutes before the last hour. So that the uh, full course caution was triggered by the 912 going off course. That was three seconds after the 912 went off course and uh, was clearly going to be stranded. That was followed in, of course, by the Lamborghini uh, as well that had an off. So 22, 6 and 52, gradient racing, Acura, 6, uh, 22 uh, Acura, yes, uh, the GT Daytona car, the 6 Acura DPI and the 52 LMP2 car. That is the leader in LMP2. So they will all take a penalty but only when we get back to green flag should we not get back to green flag there will be a time penalty assessed on the final result but i'm, I'm not even going to uh, work out what that would be at the moment because i'm absolutely certain we're going to get back to green flag there's a few puddles on the surface around the, the track but uh, not massive amounts of standing water uh, it may be that we see one of the course cars go out with a race director uh, in the car a few spots of rain still uh, on our camera lenses and thank you to our camera operators who've uh, had to leave their post as well of course uh, in the bad weather with the threat of lightning around but they've left their cameras pointing at important parts of the track so that is very very good uh, indeed from them true professionals our camera operators uh, thank you very much indeed now on the pit lane the teams are not allowed to work on their car. Race control, just to reiterate, allowed two members to help the driver out of the car. Driver can stay in or can get out. That's allowed. Car covers can be put on and a jump battery can be connected to the cars. That is all that can be done. So damaged cars cannot be repaired. Tyres cannot be changed. No work, uh, no uh, repairs, nothing at all. Uh, no servicing can be done on those cars half an hour still to go jeremy which is an interesting amount of time given how much fuel these guys have got in the car i reckon if we get restarted shortly uh, we will be able to get to the end without uh, another pit stop oh, for some of the cars yeah, at the front no, of the I field. Think so. I think no, I think so. I yeah. think this should be okay because uh, the, the most of them have done two or three laps on. Uh, Ollie Jarvis has done any of the service. Yeah, Ollie Jarvis has done six at the front of the field, but a lot of that, of course, would be behind a safety car, so yeah. that'll stretch it. Uh, Renga van der Zander is the one who's in the box seat really uh, in terms of the lead lap because he's got an extra. Uh, lap on Elio, Harry and uh, and Ollie Jarvis. In fact, he's got two laps on Elio plus, plus and, and Harry. Uh, plus, yeah. he's already got wet. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's going to be a minimum of ten minutes, isn't it? But from now, uh, before we get back to uh, to any sort of racing, so uh, I would I would suggest. So, I, I think I think you're right. I don't think there's going to be any fuel concerns for at, for at the any of the of the, uh, of the front runners at GPIs, GTLMs. I'm not quite so sure. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I'm, I'm just looking at that. Nick Tandy's been out there 26 laps, some behind mm. uh, safety car. Uh, Connor Filippi, the 25 car, stopped. That must have been close to being on the red flag as well. Or the yellow flag. Let me see when that GT left. He's not, he's not showed as, uh, as entering a closed pit, is he? No, he's so maybe, not. Maybe he got in just before it. Well, let me go back to full course yellow. And see, 25 entered the pits a minute before the full course yellow. So, yeah, they got in. So, he's fine. So, that's a great position for De Filippi in terms of fuel. Tommy Milner's been out there for uh, 27 laps as well. And John Edwards in the 24 BMW. Now, when did he stop? That must have been tight uh, as well. So, there is Connor de Filippi. There's the closed pits. 912 Earl Bamba entered a pit. That must have been closed as well, but I presume that was for emergency service. Uh, and we're hearing... Uh, uh, no, that was a no. Uh, the race clock has been stopped. The race clock has been stopped with 30 minutes remaining. 
So we are on a hold, and there's 33-0 minutes remaining. Now, let, let me again just check back. There's the 25. Where's the 24? Uh, Felipe left after the full course yellow, but he was in before. So where is the 24? Yeah, 24 was in as well. So the two BMWs got in just before the yellow flags. So they're in a good spot. And so did Antonio Garcia, even though he only been out 10 laps. So all of a sudden, Corvette's in a good spot. So uh, the 912, obviously, that car is in a problem because it went, went off and it may have some damage. But this is really good news if we get restarted, Jeremy, for the 24 and the 25 BMW, because they're just fueled before the pits were closed and for Tonio Garcia in the three Corvette Tandy who is leading the class in trouble as far as fuel is concerned he'll have to make an early pit stop uh, as soon as we get back to green flag racing so this has really thrown uh, the whole thing up in the air right now as far as GT uh, Daytona is concerned I think quite a lot of people came in just before the yellow flags yes but T-Bell Jack Hawksworth, Lawson Ashenbach, Bill Oberlin, Tony Vlander, and Paul Holton all in before, I reckon, just before the yellows. I agree. Well, just before the red at least, yes. Well, just before, before the yellow it's, came it's just yeah. before the before yellow the that's caution. important. Yeah, Yeah, before the full caution, yes, absolutely. Jack Hawks with Lawson Aschenbach, T. Bell, John Edwards, James French, Bordier, Vautier, Garcia, Van der Zander leaving the pitch, Bomarito. So 55 got in before the, uh, the stoppage as well. Um, a couple of minutes before the stoppage. Jonathan Bomarito, which I hadn't realised. So he might be on uh, wet tyres as well. Yeah, I mean, the only car that didn't stop, I think, is number 77. Right. I can hear I think, I think everybody else uh, has, uh, has been in uh, for wet weather raining tires, again. I believe. Started raining again, I'm afraid. That is not good ugly. news. And it, uh, it does look a bit nasty out there. Shea Adam is in touch with her contacts at the circuit. We've got the sweepers out trying to clear some of the surface water. It came in at turn three. That's where all the carnage happened. And there's big standing water down there. And that's where the sweepers have gone out. And it looked like it was clearing up a Canada corner a few moments ago. But I'm not sure that's the case right now. Drivers are yeah. back to the car. Drivers back to the cars, I'm hearing, from race control. Well, that's the sort of optimism we like to hear. So we might get something on a quick restart. Takes about uh, between five and ten minutes to do the warm-up procedures on the cars. We haven't seen that going yet. Uh, nothing at the moment official. Now, what's no. in interesting for me, Jeremy, is in the pit lane, the number six is sitting and having had no further work done on it. So that right. car, although it came in under a red, uh, under a, a closed pit in the yellow flag, as soon as the red flags were thrown, of course, they've stopped working on that car. So they will get... Uh, same at the 52 as well by the look of it yes it is, I can see that further down the pit lane so although they're going to get a penalty for entering a closed pit, at least they're not working under uh, the Park Fermi red flag regulations John Daggis is at the track hello John, thanks for tweeting this at IMSA Radio 77 and 911 only two cars still on slicks by his count yeah, thank you John, I agree with that stay, stay safe please my friends Great reporting from John as well over the last few days in all the changes of the calendar to IMSA. Read about that on uh, www.sportscar365.com. Uh, let's have an update from Porsche, the 912. Effectively, the car that triggered this off had a huge moment about uh, three quarters of the way down the start finish straight and ended up uh, in the, in fact, beyond the gravel at Turn 1. Shea Adam, what have you heard about Earl Bamba and Lawrence Van Toe's car? Well, he might actually want to trade out that Chevy logo that he'll be driving in the NAS Xfinity series for a Ford one because the slogan for Ford used to be built Ford tough. 
the Porsche apparently is built for tough. I just chatted with Lawrence Vantor really quickly, asked him if the car was okay since Earl Bamber was able to, after he got it out of the gravel, drive it back to the pit lane. He said, yes, but they're still not optimistic because the conditions haven't improved that much. But at least the car is okay. Second place in the championship coming into this weekend. So the 912 still have a little bit of work cut out for them to try and get up a few more places and gain a few more points. Well, John, I think that car's already a couple of laps down now after that the time it took to get the car out of the gravel trap so it's uh, one lap the, the... it is one lap down on the gtlm lead uh, sorry two laps on the gtm lead one lap on the majority of the field it's only the two leading cars tandy and de Filippi, who are on the lead lap in gtlm now right uh just a quick note by the way and again i'm i'm seeing this for the uh for probity, really, and to give as much information as possible. I, I hope we get going. We've still got 30 minutes on the clock. Uh, and I'm indebted to uh, Zabizi uh, for this. Uh, rule 47.8, a race that is red flagged after completion of 50% or more uh, of the race, not restarted, shall be scored as of the last completed green flag lap, as though the chequered flag had been displayed at that point. So that would mean the last green flag lap before completed by the leader, overall leader, at 18.53. Before um, the red or before the yellow? Before the, the last green flag lap. So that would be before the full course yellow. That would be lap 50, 50. Well, if it's lap 54, that would put the number 10 car uh, in front head, number 77. Correct. Uh, and then the... 755 and then the rest of them is the same or it's just that those top two that will have changed around i i uh, and also that more crucially in lmp2 ah. that would mean the 52 car would remain out front yeah uh, and the clock has started running and we're on a full course yellow now not a red flag so are we expecting to see cars rolling out of the pit lane but the clock has started running again and the track is now full course yellow but with nothing moving uh we uh, have got the added complication of network TV today, of course, uh, and uh, that is a consideration. Safety always the first consideration, of course, but the clock is running again under full course yellow, but with, I'm pretty certain, Shea, cars still sitting on the pit lane, the majority of them under their covers at the moment. Well, we know that the drivers were called back to their cars expecting a restart around the bottom of the half hour. So that would be 2.35 East Coast, 1.35 local, and what would that be? 5 6.35 for those are for our friends over in England. The rain continues to fall, but we are expecting to get things moving once again. And keep in mind, this was a full stop stage three weather warning but it was ah. not indicated for lightning which is why we were able to get going without a 30 minute pause we've got well, cars I, i've heard actually that, that, that there was a lightning strike and there was a 30 minute hold uh, and that kind of is in effect right now shay so uh, we've got some That's conflicting not... stories on that one yeah. not sure, quite sure which one is is necessarily right but i certainly heard that the, there was a uh, a lightning strike uh, but that's one of the reasons why we had the, the clock was on hold uh, and then uh, work but then as you say this is now the clock has started again rain is falling drivers are back in cars umbrellas rather than full covers over some of the cars so we have got movement on pit lane waiting to hear uh, the word from uh, race control of course damp drivers getting into cars that'll be steamed up interiors people having to wipe down what i can tell you uh, without uh, any fear of contradiction is the red flag has been removed and the uh, red uh, situation has been removed and replaced with a full course yellow and that announced at 25 minutes past the hour rain is falling again on the pit lane we have got uh, some penalties to come for at the very least the number 22 gradient car, the 6 Acura Penske and the 52, that's the leader in LMP2, entering closed pits. Juan Montoya just uh, concentrating and visualising as water is dripping in through the roof of his Acura at the moment. Race cars aren't meant to be watertight. And the way the 
doors go into the roof there. You don't necessarily have to have a watertight seal for that because you're not expecting to be standing still. So rain falling. We've got the Tony Vlander has got his wipers going in the 63 WeatherTech Scuderia Corsa Ferrari. He'll be wanting to get going. He loves the wet. So does Tandy, but Tandy will be hamstrung by the fact that at the moment he is still on slick tyres. We believe only the 77 leading car as it scored at the moment and the leading GTLM, the 911 Porsche, are the only two cars in the pit lane that are still on full slick dry weather tyres. Now, what do you do if there's no call to allow them to change? I suppose, Jeremy, you've got, you've got to take the risk and go out behind the safety car and circulate behind the safety car on the slicks you, you, and stay out. You've got to just stay out on those slick tyres because you, you, you've got the class lead at the point. Tandy's in fuel trouble. I'm not sure how much longer Tandy can go around without needing fuel. Now, he can come in for emergency service, which means he can have five seconds worth of fuel, but emergency service wouldn't count him changing his tyres to, if he had a puncture, he could change one tyre, but it would have to be a like-for-like -like swap. He can't go to wet weather tyres. So they're in a real quandary. Yeah, yeah. there's uh, there's all sorts of question marks here to, that need to be answered. Uh, and uh, there's still 25 minutes remaining on the clock. So we've certainly got time to get things going again. But this, you know, we've seen a couple of rain squalls come through just from the cameras we've been able to see. And uh, we haven't heard of any... Uh, any uh, thunder activity lately so that's what we've got to keep our our, uh, our eyes and ears on i think think number four also on slicks Shea says and that would that would make sense because tommy milner didn't pit when everybody else did in the number four so let's add number four corvette to the drivers still on inappropriate tires for the conditions so 77 mazda leading the race and dpi 911 porsche leading uh, GTLM and number four third in GTLM but off ah now that's just been taken off the lead lap which that, car uh, that's interesting right we've got cars rolling we've got cars rolling they're behind the safety car we've got which, cars which rolling which car's gone off the lead lap John uh, no sorry hang on let me just let me just check this because they're rolling out of the pit lane at the moment and he's in front so he's in front we've got a right mix up here Jeremy because the because when the red flag had come out, we hadn't done the, the as you said, we didn't do the pass by. So I'm going to have to. It, they've and they've un, only now crossed the start finish line. So that's resetting some of the gaps within the classes as they go around. But there's been no tyre changes in the pit lane. So the cars that we thought were uh, on on. Uh, dry weather tyres, including the scored leader of the race, is still on dry weather tyres, including the 911 of Nick Tandy, who is going out of the pits now. He's still on dry weather tyres. I'm just seeing where Tommy Milner is at the moment. Right, I still think that it's still only the top two in GT Le Mans who are on the lead lap in class. Yes, but I think, as you suggest, the, the wave around is still to be done. The Correct. pass around is still to be done. Correct. So, uh, unfortunately, with the scoring system we have, we can't tell until we see them physically who that well, uh, relates I, I, to. Yeah, Tommy Milner is definitely in front of the two leaders in class. Right. So, he's on the back, the very back end of the lead lap. And right. I think that might apply as well to John Edwards uh, and to Tonio Garcia. But Earl Bamba is a further lap back from those. So depending on what happens. Now, we're getting a wave by. We are getting... Here's the wave by going on now. So this is the cars trapped between the pace car and their... and the lead car, but not in the lead class. And the number four has gone straight on. That tells me that it really was at turn five. Uh, the number three car goes straight on at turn five. So I thought they had changed tyres for Tonio Garcia because he was in the pits just before the yellow flag. But maybe they didn't. Now, they... Well, the, the good news, though, John, is that he, he has got the wave around, so he is going to be... Pass around, yeah, sorry. Pass around, yeah, I should have said. Yeah. So uh, he is going to be back on the, on the lead lap then with the other GTLM cars. The number 912 car, I think, is going to be correct. Uh, at least one lap down. 
Correct. I think everybody else should be should be okay. Yeah. So normally inside the last half an hour we would have what's called a, a quickie yellow uh, and not have the pass bar, the pass around and the wave by. But I think given the circumstances uh, and it's always at the race director's uh, discretion. I think this is not a bad idea. Uh, what I haven't seen yet is the pit lane being open for anybody. And I'll tell you as soon as I see that. So the clock is running. We're down to 21 and a bit minutes. So we're back to normal full course yellow conditions with the detritus around the track, i.e. the cars that dropped it. Still difficult conditions, particularly for anybody who is not on wet weather tyres, even if you are. Shea Adam with an update on who might still be on slick. Shea, uh, wh what do you reckon? We knew 77 uh, Mazda 911 Porsche. What else do you think? And uh, uh, what else do you think out there? Well, the four core Tommy Milner also out there on slick tyres. I've just sent a text message over to Ryan Smith to, to find out if the sister car, the three that went straight on a five, if they are also on slick tyres. But I've just heard from Robbie Foley that the number six Turner Motorsport BMW, the car that was completely rebuilt yesterday, Bill Oberlin is on dry weather tyres right now. So it might be a bit of a rush when we go back to an open pit lane because he seems to think that the cars around him, they might do. Yeah, OK, well, we'll say that. Uh, we, we haven't got the pit lane open yet because of the of what's going on. The 912, as uh, Shea said, had survived virtually unscathed. Uh, it's it, uh, knocked off the left-hand door mirror uh, when it went into the wall sideways. That was a, an immense accident, which... Uh, and poor Earl Bamba must have known it was happening for about six seconds before it did, Jeremy, because he'd, uh, he'd lost control and was aquaplaning uh, just at the exit of the pit lane, it seemed to me. And he's on the grass, off the grass, facing forward, facing backwards. It's like when you lose it on ice and you're thinking, oh, there's nothing I can do here. No, no, shut your eyes and uh, take your hand off the steering wheel almost. I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's when you start praying, isn't it? Yeah, but, that you don't uh, hit anything hard. The, ch yeah. the team have given that 912 car a cursory, a little bit more than a cursory glance, and the only damage they could find uh, was the problem with the door mirror. Now, that car won't have changed, I presume, won't have changed tyres as well. Sliding sideways from well down the straight. It's backwards, it's sideways, it's frontwards, it's sideways, it's backwards. It clips the tyre wall. But He's it was... Jolly lucky. Oh, yeah. He didn't collect anybody, anybody. else, John, isn't he? That's Correct. an incredible thing. Well, imagine what that would have been like back in uh, a few years ago when there wasn't that much runoff there. Uh, yeah. it, it could have been outside the track. We've seen that happen with single seaters before. Yeah, AJ Foyt in particular, he had a horrendous accident there. Mm. So, let's see. Prototype, uh, pits are open for prototype. Pits are open for prototype. Now, Jeremy Shaw, with your team manager's hat on, the 77, in bad weather, with 18 and a half minutes to go, is leading the race. A race that we hope will get restarted, but we don't know. Do you pit him for wet weather tyres, or do you roll the dice and leave him out? <laughs> Too late. I would have said you got to, I would have said you got to pit him. But, he stayed uh, out. The, the, yeah, apparently not. So, the, the, I think the, the team are clearly gambling that uh, even with 18 minutes to go, there's going to be another stoppage and we won't be able to get back to, uh, to green. I, I like this. I like this from race control. They're giving everybody the opportunity. Durrani will come in because he's got a damaged car. Uh, the front left-hand side still bearing the scars of his off earlier on. So the 31 will drop out of... Uh, well, might not drop out of sixth position, actually, because 40 is a lap further back. That's correct. Yeah, that's so correct. He, he that's a, a free stop for him in terms of the points. Uh, and he'll be able to put a new set of wets on and a new nose on that car. Now, next time around, the pits will be open for GT Le Mans. And Nick Tandy's problem is he's been out there a long time. How much fuel has he got left? So that's the, the tough choice for Tandy. Uh, Tandy will be coasting down the hill, turning the engine off, uh, working anywhere that he can. There's a big puddle halfway down the front straight, which is being guarded by one of the safety vehicles at the moment, which is about where uh, about where Earl Bamba started his accident, and it didn't finish till 200 yards further down the road. Shea Adam, Durrani is in the pits, and this is legal service. This is, and they are doing the nose change on this car. I'm just making sure that the suspension, that nose body cover is still intact, checking the left, and then the 
movement of the car, putting a new nose on, and people will be allowed to go back out. As you said, John, he should maintain that sick, that fifth position fairly safely, uh, but all lane was the Mustang, or no, the Mustang sampling car did stay out. So yes, people will lose one position. Thank you, Shit. Uh, now, I, I was mentioning before, I thought the 912 must have entered a closed pit, but we haven't seen that yet on the pit channel. Uh, GT Le Mans 912 entered the pits. So was that him coming out? Was that him coming out of the pits when he had his accident then? No, it can't have been. Full course yellow. He was still leading the race at that stage, wasn't he, when he went off? No, the 912. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, 912 entered the pits at ni oh, that 19.08. Oh, no, that's the next full course yellow. Sorry, I need to scroll back uh, before that. Uh, 912 resumed, 912 resumed. 912 did not come in after he's off, so it got pulled out of the gravel and didn't come in until everybody came in behind the safety car. So that's very interesting. So he's managed to... Uh, to get in there. See, I've got him there. I've got him entering at 19.08. Uh, 34. Which was... Was that everybody coming in? Yeah, that was that was everybody coming in after the red flag. That's why. OK. So those of you who are uh, looking at that and uh, getting in the same way confused, that was... Uh, after the red flag as they were being led in by the safety car so that's why the 912 is not getting the penalty uh, and hello to john de geese who's passed on some news to our vp racing fuels pit lane reporter share adam uh, just hearing from team communication that there is a wheel ah, coming sorry. off of the left front of the 25 bmw uh, actually it was reported through the Porsche radio system as Earl Bamber is behind the 25 and he it on the track. First, I thought maybe it was a little head game saying, hey, the car in front of me is losing a wheel. He should come into the pits. But nope, nope. I have had visual confirmation of that. Connor D. Filippi will be needing a trip down the pit lane and the pits are open for GT this time by. And that is the second place car in GT. Sorry, uh, I, I saw the note from John. I thought it might have been JD. But uh, uh, that's uh, coming in from John Edwards who's sitting in uh, behind his teammate Connor D. Felipe. Well, uh, at the carousel, the rain has eased. I'm not going to say it's it stopped. We're down to 14 minutes. We have seen IMSA being prepared to run behind the safety car and run time out. That's what happened at Sebring, uh, Jeremy, uh, earlier in the season. The gamble for Ollie Jarvis is if it does go back green. Uh, he's going to be eaten up by the cars behind, but if it doesn't, then he could be looking at a race victory. The problem, uh, uh, the same choice would seem to be the same for Nick Tandy. His problem is he's got to be getting short of fuel now. That's right, and for the number 77 car, look, if he, come, if he came in now, he dropped to the back of the class. If he comes in later on, he's going to drop to the back of the class. So you might as well just stay out there and, and hope for the best. Uh, that's uh, the reason for that. The number 31 car, on the other hand, well, that had damage in any case. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, that was at the back of the pack in uh, in DPI, sixth position, last car on the lead lap. So they had no nothing to lose by coming into the pits and uh, t taking on whatever service they could. And that was all legal. So I've just checked back, and it would appear to me that when we go back to green, the three closed pit infractions that we mentioned before, which were the number six. Uh, Acura Team Penske DPI, the number 52, that's the the uh, PL1 Matheson leading LMP2 car. And that car, in fact, has not returned out of the pits, that car. That is still in the pits, so that may be moot. So that means Ben Hanley has assumed the lead for Dragon Speed in the 81 car and the 22, that's the Gradient Racing accurate with mark miller behind the wheel uh, he is due a penalty as well when we go back to green all right pits are open for gt let's see any takers that we get remember the 911 porsche is the leader
but is short on fuel and on slick tyres. We've got a couple of slick tyres there, and there will have been some conversations. I bet the radio traffic was interesting this last lap around, particularly as Jarvis stayed out. Here comes Tandy coming towards the back of the line now. He's got his wiper going. And, oh, well, we've got a couple of takers. Uh, that looks like the 96 going in. Yes, it is. So Shea did say that the turn of BMW we thought was still on slicks, was reported from the team, thank you, has been on slicks. And that car has gone into the pit lane. There was another car in front of it as well that went into the pit lane, which I didn't catch sight of. Uh, it, was, uh, it was the 74 Riley car that went in. Uh, Paul holton has gone in for Compass Racing in the 76 as well. That's the McLaren. So they're taking service in pit lane at the moment. Uh, and looking at those guys, they hadn't been out all that long. So that must be the fact that they were on the wrong tyres. And Tommy Milner's come in, Conor de Filippi's come in, and Nick Tandy's come in. So they've all come in as well. So they didn't think that the chance was worth taking and a pass in the pit lane and this could be crucial and the 74 stays ahead of Turner Motorsports BMW now GT Le Mans Tandy needs fuel as well of course as the, the tyre change so that's going to slow him down both Porsches came in the pit lane Tandy is out so he has retained, I believe, the lead in GT Le Mans. Everybody in GT Le Mans came in. That was interesting. Do you concur with that, Mr Shaw? Uh, sorry, what was the question? I missed the question. Everybody in GT Le Mans appears to have come into the pit lane. And I reckon it was Tandy ahead of Tommy Milner. I I Excuse me, I think 24 and number three car stayed out. Uh, but the... Uh... Ah, yes, yeah. Yeah, OK. So I think uh, that, yeah, that will put them into the lead Correct. of the class. The, uh, the, 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 by the way, the, the number the three and number four cars uh, switched places during that, during, after they went out to, for the, to get ready for the restart. There was a, a, a note from Race Control because there was a couple of cars were on slick tyres, really, 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 really struggling. Number, four, number 44 in particular, uh, there was a note put, put, put out to say that you, for the cars behind them, you were allowed to wet, pass. You could make that pass. Yeah. So now number four cars come to pit lane, as you say. So he's uh, back on strategy with the other class leaders. This is certainly is going to look good now for John Edwards and Garcia too. Will well, be up into second place in the class. Jeremy, Ollie Jarvis is still leading. But it looks like we are going back. There's a DPI class split ongoing at the moment. I've just been reminded by Carol Brink that Lena Gade involved with that car. Never second guessed the Gade. She was involved in a race that, a six hour race that only had 16 laps all behind the safety car. And yet we had a positional change because work had to be done on one of the Audis and it dropped position in the safety car train. So she's remembered that, undoubtedly, and they're rolling the dice at the moment. But surely, if we do go back to green, then that was at Fuji, by the way. The back lights in the are out, aren't they? The lights are out. We're going back to green flag racing. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it was worth the gamble, because I said a few minutes ago, if they came in when the pits were open, they were going to fall to the Correct. back of the pack. If they come in now, they're going to fall to the back of the pack. So uh, it was worth that gamble, certainly. Three laps, I reckon, maybe four depending on when we get going and when the leader comes back towards the line. Watch out for Nick Tandy because he is a demon in the wet and he'll want to regain the places he lost for having to come into the pit lane. Ollie Jarvis is going to be struggling mightily. Renga van der Zander, remember, stopped just before the yellow flag came out, which subsequently was upgraded to a red flag. Seven and a half minutes to go, I reckon, by the time we get to the start-finish line. Van der Zander and everyone behind on wet. It looks like Ollie Jarvis is going to peel straight into the pits. He can't do that. Can't do that. He's got to, he's got to come round one more lap. That's right, Shea, isn't it? Correct. The pits are closed when you go back to green. Yeah, that's a big mistake from Mazda. Having said that, he's just getting out of the way, I suppose. It's not going to affect where he finishes. Van der Zander then leads. Castro Neves... 
trying to hold on to second from Bomarito. Here's Durrani. Durrani's already moving up. Fantastic stuff. He's, Durrani was ahead of Bomarito before the first corner. And the 31 car, watch that wheel and car go now. He's got his sights set on Castro Neves in the classes. John Edwards leads from Corvette of BMW, but they were so close together. Nick Tandy already back up into third as he went across the line. Fantastic stuff. Out comes Juan Montoya as well. They were, once we went back to yellow flag racing, of course, they were allowed to work on that car. So he's rejoined many laps down. Once the red flag uh, was removed and Park Fermi was removed, this is going to be an interesting last six minutes, Jeremy. It certainly is, yes. Uh, and really tricky out there. I mean, it's, it's, it, I think everybody now is on uh, wet weather tyres. That's the good news, but it is very treacherous out there and easy to make a mistake. But what a good opportunity here for Renko van der Zander. Yeah, he's uh, no, no uh, stranger to racing in the rain and uh, he'll be... Uh, Looking oh. to take advantage of this opportunity. Does he have that straight line speeder to stay ahead of that very fleet Acura of Elio Castro Nevers? Another Porsche GT to watch is Pat Long. He's up to fourth position and only a second and a half away from the leader, T Bell. He's got V Lander right ahead of him. And that's going to be an interesting battle as well as we're side by side. There's a touch as the Acura makes contact. Castro Nevers makes contact with the back of Renga van der Sanderit. Canada corner. This is all getting very serious. Five and a half to go. And here comes Pipo Durrani. Third position. And off, off goes the leader. And I think that I think we've got a change there. Yes, we have the act. I could barely see through the sprays that came across the start finish line. Little mistake by Van der Zander. And that's going to drop the Cadillac into the clutches of people Durrani who's somewhere in the ball of spray going down to turn one. Yeah, the other guy that's struggling is uh, Jonathan Bomarito. Uh, he's uh, dropped a long, long way back there. He was running his third place at the restart. He's been overtaken by both uh, Pipo Durrani and Sebastian Bourdais. Trying to see the GT cars as they come through. Edwards from Garcia from Tandy. Only three seconds between those three. GT Daytona. Townsend Bell from Farmbacker. That's the two bright. Oh no, Farmbacker's up in the second now. He's gone past Hawksworth. Vlander still in fourth. And Pat Long right there as well. He's dropped back a little bit. It is just survival at the moment, even on wet weather tyres. It's very tricky indeed just to drive round. Never mind to race in close contact. Second and third together. The two Cadillacs coming out of turn six into turn seven. It won't be flat now, will it? Down towards turn eight through the hurry downs area of the circuit. Still standing water on the run down from the carousel as well. So it's not just about braking, Jeremy. You're going to have to be very careful, even driving in a straight line here. These cars have got very low ride heights and it's very easy to get aquaplaning where if you get the plank in the middle of the floor on the ground, then effectively you're driving a very expensive uh, boogie board, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. No, not a lot of fun, quite frankly, uh, for these guys at the moment. So uh, it's really, some of them are really struggling. Some of them are struggling a lot more than others. The guy who's not struggling is Mario Farbacher. He's absolutely flying in that uh, Maya Shank racing car number 86, up to second place in the class, and really putting the pressure on Townsend Bell, who still leads for Lexus. Yeah, this has been a good run from far back in the mid-engined Meershank Racing at NSX, the number 86 car. You can see that one. It's got the bright pink top, and he's in the spray behind as they come side by side down to Canada Corner. Townsend Bell steers to the right-hand side. How brave is Super Mario? He's very brave indeed. He's almost on the white line to drive his left. Can he drive all the way around the outside of Canada Corner? He's giving it a go. He's giving it a go. And he's turned it into a pass for the lead. That was extraordinary. There is a driver with full confidence in his Michelin wet tyres, his ability, and the setup on that car. What a pass. If that's the win in GTD, what a way to do it. That was absolutely superb by Mario Farnbacher. 
Uh, credit to Dan Townsend Bell for not doing anything silly and just not taking him out. But uh, what a great move that was. That was all about confidence, wasn't it? That little Acura, you know, he, he knows how to win races in this uh, in this guy. He did it last year. So uh, he's, he can do it again right now. It'll be the white flag next time around. Now, Pitbull Durrani, he's dropped away just a little bit from Renga van der Zanden, so it's down. And a spin for Tristan Fortier, seventh position in the 85 JDC Miller Cadillac. But that, I hope, won't affect what's going on at the front of the field. If Cadillac are going to win this race, and my goodness, they were so close, it's going to be down to Renga van der Zanden to make amends for that tiny mistake. But the Cadillac seems to be struggling just a little bit as Renga is trying to find grip on the circuit. He's certainly not on the normal racing line. Castro Neves into the carousel for what I believe will be the penultimate time. The rain is getting worse at that side of the circuit. Now, do you hang on and take the position you've got? Oh, big slide down a turn. Number three, the hard point uh, Audi is off. The Acura that was leading had a huge slide coming out the carousel last time around. It's getting very dicey indeed. It will be white flag next time around. Van der Zander squirming that Cadillac down through the kink and down towards Canada Corner. It's a little bit drier in that part of the circuit, but that's relative at the moment. But at least there's not standing water down there. Leader doesn't even try and get anywhere near the apex. That's because he's trying to steer off the rubber in this situation because that will be so, so slippery. In towards the final corner, he's got four miles and the run to the white flag still to go. Steers well off the exit curves. Team Penske back in form in qualifying and they may just have snatched this one. Still Durrani in third position and off has got Tandy. Tandy pushing too hard and there's another car there. That's at the kink and that is the BMW. That's the BMW that he was fighting with. That's the, that was, that's the uh, John Edwards car, isn't it? So that was the leader in class, and he's right across rain again. the circuit. And now reversing onto a live track, the BMW driver, that's John Edwards. So has Garcia gone through in the Corvette? Full course yellow, full course yellow. So the, free, the field will be frozen. The leader has started his last lap, so we won't actually see the safety car but that means the field is frozen. There will be no more passing. And Acura Team Penske, uh, Elio Castro Neves will bring the car back home by dint of a brilliant, brilliantly opportunist manoeuvre as soon as there was a slight problem for the leader. Dean Cameron did the hard work in the dry, but Castro Neves has brought it home. Van der Zander, uh, will be second for Konik Minolta and it will be the Brazilian pairing of Felipe Naza and Pipo Durrani in third in GT Le Mans. Corvette, one and two, they've done it again. After the accident on the far side of the circuit, Nick Tandy's not, oh, he might get that car home. I'm not sure though, he's in the, he's in the mud, he's in the dirt. It will be Corvette three from Corvette four, Tonio Garcia from Tommy Milner, third for John Edwards in the, Remaining BMW, uh, the where's the other BMW gone? The 25 car that's disappeared as well. Well, Townsend Bill got back ahead of uh, of uh, Mario Farnbacher on that last lap as well. Did Farnbacher take the lead? Did he? I didn't. Uh... Oh yes, of course yeah, he did. Yeah, Farnbacher yes, took the, the lead. Yes, I think of course he did. got it back again. And Hawksworth holds on to third. So it all happened. Now uh, what we'll have to see is whether that happened before the full course yellow went out. And I'm sure they'll be looking at that now. So Corvette, Corvette BMW in GT Le Mans. Ian Vassar Sullivan, 12 from Farnback is 86. Uh, MSR and then Jack Hawksworth in third place for Ian Vassar Sullivan. Tony Vlander just off the podium. And in P2, Ben Hanley wins it from for Dragon Speed with well, the he's got to get it back to he's got to get it back to the line John well that it, well that is true taken the checkered flag yeah well in fact nobody has that's how they no. sit behind well and look how wet it is yeah this isn't over yet Jeremy you're absolutely right the leader we haven't got the safety car out there because the leader had already started his last lap so there was no time to get the the safety car out in front of the leader the rain is hammering down and coming out of every orifice of the 
racing cars at the moment. Farnbacher is right up alongside the leader in GT Le Mans. So how did that happen? That's something. We're hearing a spin, a spin for Mario Farnbacher at turn 11 is what we're hearing. So that is where that one changed. Checkered flag is in the air with the double yellows and the IMSA Road Racing Showcase. Well, what a showcase we have had because we've had everything. We've had lap record pace. We've had tactics. We've had survival in the bad weather. As through to take the checkered flag comes the number seven, Acura Team Penske. It's Castro Nevis who brings the car home. Dan Cameron qualified the car. Van der Zander brings the Koenig and Minolta Cadillac home and it's Cadillacs two and three with Pipo Durrani just not able to press home the advantage later on for the Brazilian crude wheel and car. Then it'll be Bordet if he can get that car to the line. Only those first three have finished at the moment. What a race. Parente going very slowly, I'm hearing as well from race control. What's happened to yeah, him? He was a couple of laps down. I think he had an incident uh, before. Bordier the finishes old... fourth. Jeremy, yeah, sorry, just as they come across no, no, no. the line. Yeah. Ben Hanley has crossed the line and wins LMP2. Eighth position overall. Waiting for the GTDs and the GT Le Mans to come in. Oli Jarvis still to appear as well for Mazda. It'll be a fifth and sixth for Mazda. Tristan Fortier will be seventh because he was a lap off the lead. Montoya has pitted, but he had only just come out of the pit. He was lapsed down as well. So he will see the checkered flag in the pit lane, waiting for the GT Le Mans cars. Bell from Farnbacher, Vassar Sullivan in Vassar Sullivan from Mershank, Lexus from Acura there. And it should be Jack Hawks with who's the next through to make it a 1 3 for. Lexus still waiting for GT Le Mans. Here they come across the line. Garcia and Milner. Corvette do it again. Absolutely extraordinary. Since we've come back from the big pause, it's been all about Corvette and Corvette racing. And the three car this time takes it from the four. Third position in GT Le Mans. Really all about survival. The remaining BMW. And I still don't know what happens to the 25 car. John, Ed uh, uh, John Edwards gets that one back. Well, the 25 car, I wonder if that was one of the... That was the car that was involved, was it, with... Uh... No, that car pitted some time ago and is four laps off the lead. So, huge amount of clean-up to go on at the kink. Uh, fourth in GT Le Mans, Earl Bamba. And that'll be it, I think, for those guys. Oh, Jeremy, what, what can I tell you? Yeah. What can it's I tell the, you? The odd thing, the odd thing for me was uh, the, the, still a few cars still out in the racetrack. There's number 85 and number 77. They haven't made it back to the checkered flag yet. The strange thing was the masses were so so far off the pace once we went back to uh, back to green. Obviously, the 77 car was at the back because it it came in and made a pit stop. Sure, but number 55 just, uh, car. Uh, just hold that thought for a second, Jeremy, because we can go to Shea Adam for a a, a, a report from the pit lane and probably get one of the drivers as well. Ah, the BMW went off first and hit the wall and I think was followed in at the kink by Tandy uh, because of all the water down there. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Shea, who have you got for us in this uh, VP Racing Fuels uh, uh, pit lane report? GTLM race winner Jordan Tan just waiting for him to try and answer the phone. Hearing that cell signal is very limited with this storm actually in the area right now but he did have his phone on him and he was able to text back to say that he is waiting for our car our call uh, but he's not able to answer quite yet okay we'll come back to you uh, when we can yeah uh, just uh, as a note there on the slowing down lap Renga van der Zander actually went between one of the safety vehicles and the stranded 911 it's so treacherous out the back and there's so much water out there but it was definitely the bmw that went around first of john edwards the 24 car uh, and tandy followed him in they were having a scrap at the sharp end of the field 
Uh, Edwards did get the car back home, damaged though it was, the number 24 to third position. Nick Tandy sadly did not make it to the end. Sorry, Jeremy, what were you saying there? We'll just wrap this up before we go to Michelin Post Race Tech. I uh, can't remember. <laughs> I was just try trying to figure out the points, uh, to be honest. OK, let's and, uh, uh, have some closing thoughts then with the clear-up continuing. For those of you at the circuit, please take shelter. And thanks for staying with us. We've got Michelin Post Race Tech to come uh, and we'll have a, a quick dash through what's happening as the winning cars head to Victory Circle. Uh, let's... Uh, just wrap up our race coverage right now and head to Michelin Post Race Tech. Stay with us uh, on IMSA Radio and 87.7 FM for the... On 87.7 around the circuit, it will be the podium in a few moments' time. Go on to RS2 IMSA Radio for Michelin Post Race Tech. Thank you to everybody at the track and to Charlotte for making sure we had the pictures. Also, of course, uh, to our IMSA technical crew at Road America. Kerry Cobb was our producer in London. Shea Adam and Jeremy Shaw joined me, John Hindhoff, uh, as the VP Racing Fuel uh, pit lane reporter in Shea's case. And Jeremy and I were in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Coming next, Michelin Post Race Tech. Stay tuned. Well, extraordinary scenes to finish the race and still cars coming to the end of their slowing down lap. Uh, the Oli Jarvis Mazda still out there and barely be able to go around it, not much more than walking pace at the moment. What a year 2020 has been. Welcome to Michelin Post Race Tech. Jeremy Short and Shea Adam have stayed uh, with me. Let's do the uh, points first of all before we get to your questions. Hashtag Michelin PRT to Atims Radio, uh, by the way. It got a bit exciting towards the end there. I forgot to mention that before. Jeremy, how do things stand in DPI at the sharp end? In the sharp end, the, uh, the the points leaders coming to this weekend were Ryan Briscoe and Renga van der Zander. They were well tied with Oliver Jarvis and Tristan Nunez. As a result of the second place finish today, Ryan Briscoe and Renga van der Zander will now lead on 124. In second place will be Joao Barbosa and uh, Sebastian Bourdais, who don't quite keep their podium streak alive, but they will be on 118, so six behind, one point ahead of Oliver Jarvis and Tristan Nunez. Uh, and next up in the will be on 115, so two points behind them, it's Pipo Durrani. And then a couple of points behind them are uh, Bomrito and Tinknell Manufacturers Championship. Cadillac will uh, extend the lead from, they'll have 134 to 129 of Mazda, 125 of Accio, who scored, which scores his first win today. Uh, and uh, it's we'll come to the others in a moment, Shea Adam. I'll let you just do a little bit more addition, uh, Jeremy. A lot of firsts today, Shea Adam, uh, uh, from our VP Racing Fuels Pit and Paddock report. Yeah, it's the first win in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship for Frank Montecalvo. He got his first pole the last race out at Sebring International Raceway. The first win for Townsend Bell since VIR 2015 when he was sharing with Bill Sweedler in a Ferrari. So that is approximately... No, let's give the exact 1,806 days ago. It's the first win at Road America in IMSA competition for Elio Castroneves, uh, Ricky Taylor, Jordan Taylor, and Antonio Garcia, which is kind of hard to believe. Jeremy Shaw has the other results, uh, or the other points after the results, all unofficial at the moment. I, I have a suspicion there's still a few penalties to be uh, applied at the moment. Uh, what do you reckon, uh, Jeremy? Where would you like to go next? Would you like to go to GT Le Mans or LMP2? Let's do LMP2, shall we? Yep. Uh, we've got... Uh... Uh, Cameron Castles, I reckon, will take the lead in the LMP2 class on 64. One ahead of Patrick Kelly, 
who uh, slipped back, of course, with that incident at the end. They were leading very comfortably, he and Simon Trimmer. But uh, 64 to 63. 61 will be Henry, Henrik Hedman. And 60, Dwight Merriman and Carl Tilley in the era car. So super tight in LMP2. Of course, this is only the second championship race of the season for LMP2. Uh, and in GT Le Mans? GT Le Mans, uh, Antonio Garcia and Jordan Taylor, of course, will extend their lead now, 130 points to the 120 of the Porsche of Lawrence Van Tor and Earl Bamba. 117 for Gavin Milner, another second place finish today. And Jesse Krohn and John Edwards on 116 in fourth place for BMW. And whilst we're talking about GT Le Mans, let's have a word with one of the victorious drivers from Corvette Racing. Race win in IMSA number one or three. Share, Adam. <laughs> Just appropriate for a driver of the number three car, Jordan Taylor finally getting that race win at Road America. We have no idea what happened on the last lap because we can only see what the cameras can see. But for you on the pit stand, how nerve wracking was it to watch and to know that it's all in Antonio's hands? I mean, I'm, I was happy I wasn't in there. It looked uh, pretty miserable, and especially on that last lap before it went yellow, it looked like the kink had just started pouring again. Um, and it looked like the BMW and Porsche didn't um, get that message. So I think our guys relayed it to him, and thankfully he was able to tiptoe through there and make it through. And uh, it's just a you know proof that Corvette Racing never gives up, especially when we were kind of down and out of it in the middle and just never gave up. And uh, sorry, we're uh, getting kicked out of the podium area. We got to go in well, there. It's, it's an exciting uh, podium because not only did you win GTLM, but Ricky winning in uh, DPI and your dad's team finishing in second. So it's going to be a whole family affair in that podium. Yeah, I, I don't know if Ricky and I have ever won the same race in different class. So that's cool. I mean, I was watching their race as much as I was watching mine. Uh, obviously. <laughs> I was cheering for the 10 and the 7, so either one of them I'd be happy with. I know the 10 hasn't won here either. Um, but, yeah, it's great for Ricky and Elio. They've had a tough year, so it's good for them to get a little bounce back and get some good points. Uh, uh, a tied off here in the Haggerty Global Broadcast Centre. Uh, congratulations, first of all. Great uh, first part of the race, uh, Jordan. Uh, so uh, did, did your team tell Antonio about the weather conditions on the far side of the circuit? Uh, that, and that, that clearly made a big difference at the end because that's how you guys stayed on the track. Yeah, I think the way, you know, our race went to a three-stop pretty early on and the way we were on the track, track position-wise, um, we saw the rain ahead of the other guys, so we were able to duck in the pits before we went to that first yellow. So it was a great call by them. I'd say a little bit was a bit lucky uh, where we were track position-wise, but at the end of the day, the guys made the right call to go, you know, with that strategy, and Antonio did the, the perfect job at the end to pretty much survive the conditions and, you know, bring, a, bring home another one-two finish for the Corvette C8R. Just extraordinary, mate. Well done. Go and enjoy the podium. Thank you. Great stuff from Shea Adam, our VP Racing Fuels, uh, Pitt and Paddock reporter, and Jordan Taylor joining us. Thank you for his time uh, on the uh, telephone as well. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, I mean, it's just been a brilliant opening to the season, Jeremy Shaw, here on Michelin Post Race Tech. Uh, since we've returned to racing, uh, Corvette have, have just been absolutely extraordinary. Back to the Corvette of old. Yeah, very much so. I mean, they have been perfect. I mean, they've certainly got a slice of good fortune today, no question about it. And you know, when things are going your way, they tend to go your way even better. And that's exactly what happened today for Corvette Racing. They didn't have the fastest car. Well, they had a super fast car, but uh, it certainly wasn't as consistent as the other contenders. And uh, But, uh, you know, they still come away with uh, not only uh, a win, but another 1-2 finish. Yeah, another one to finish, adding to their tally, which, oh, now, is it 65 now for Corvette? No, 62 for Corvette. Uh, I only know that because it was 61 last time, and I could skim back through the tweets for that. At uh, Mission and PRT, Dave Alcock, race organisers, did a really good job handling those com conditions, as did all the uh, teams, and well done for making sense of the... 
uh, the changes. Uh, another good win for for GT in GTD for Lexus. Still, despite a little bit of a BOP change, Jeremy uh, says Dave Alcock, uh, that there's still a, a, an opportunity perhaps to get them pegged back a little bit. They, they might still have been slightly too dominating today. Yeah, they they certainly that was that was far and away the quickest car again all weekend long. We saw the pace that they showed in qualifying. They were significantly quicker than everybody else in qualifying. And yeah, I think the uh, the technical uh, brain trust at IMSA is going to be able to look at that again. But uh, you know they drove well today. Great, great hats off to uh, to Townsend Bell and uh, Frankie Montecalvo. Uh, isn't it interesting that last time out at Sebring, Montecalvo qualified first. Tedic second, so the, the number 12 car ahead of the 14. They finished the race the other way around. Here, mirror image. It was number 14 car. Aaron Tedic got his first ever pole position, yet they had to end up in the third position at the end uh, behind the sister car, number 12. And uh, what a great effort by Mario Farnbacker to move up into what well, ended up being second place. We saw him take the lead. We didn't see how he fell behind uh, Townsend Bell on that uh, effectively on the final lap race. It's one lap before the end mm. that uh, that repass was made. The points though in GTD, uh, Jack Hawksworth will lead on 87, Aaron Tielitz on 84. The reason for that, of course, they drove different cars in the first race at Daytona. In oh sorry, in second place actually on 86, just one behind will be Townsend Bell and Frankie Montecalvo. Tielitz third on 84, fourth position. On 83, Mario Farnbacher and Matt McMurray. And then fifth position equal on 78, both the Ryan Hardwick and Patrick Long in the Porsche for Wright Motorsports and also Cooper McNeil and Tony Vlander in the WeatherTech Ferrari. In the Manufacturer Championship in GTD, the, well, the new leader now is, now is Lexus. Uh, taking over the lead, they were tied on points with Lamborghini coming in here. You've been now Lexus on 94. Acura on 89, Ferrari on 86, Porsche on 84, Lamborghini all the way, all the way down to fifth on 83. 